So the, the subject is the prophetic model of teaching. How did the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how did he teach? And now some people, they might ask a question, um, well, why do I need to do, why do I need to know this? I'm not a teacher. And the argument that I would make is that if you're Muslim, by default you're a teacher. And the reason is, is because the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, بَلِّغُوا anni وَلَوْ aya." Convey from me, convey, you know, transmit from me, even if it is just one verse from the Qur'an. And it doesn't necessarily mean that a person has to be a scholar. That's another thing. Sometimes, and I hear this a lot, people say, well, I'm hesitant to teach because I'm not a scholar. In that prophetic command where he says, convey from me, even if it's just one ayah, because maybe a person who hears it will have more understanding than you. Maybe the person who hears it will have more understanding than you. So what happened in the first generations is anybody who heard the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they collected a hadith, they memorized it, then they would preserve it. And people would go out to look for those people. They would travel far distances. They would say, I heard that you have a hadith of the Messenger of Allah preserved. Do you have it? And they said, yes. So that began the process of collection of hadith. The hadith collectors then, they would put it together and they say, this is an authentic narration with an authentic chain of transmitters and so forth. Here it is. But we might not understand the full implications of what this hadith has in it. And so then that's the job of the fuqaha, the jurists, the mujtahideen, to look at the hadith and then to say, oh, this is what this means. So that process of transmitting, even if you don't understand the full meaning of it, just go ahead and transmit it. Does that make sense? So even if you maybe don't understand the full meaning of a certain ayah or a certain surah, if you have a chance to convey it to another person, just convey it. You don't have to give necessarily your opinion or the rulings, just go ahead and convey it. In that process of conveying though, we have to make sure that we're following the prophetic model of that conveying. Because, um, well let me just back up a little bit. If we, if, we, if we agree that we have to convey, and we can say that that conveying is a form of teachers, then in that moment of conveying, we all become teachers in that capacity. And so when we do that, then we also want to make sure that our method of conveying the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that it's also according, according to his sunnah. And I'll give you um, a quote that I learned from one of my students, one of the students through Tayba Foundation, where we teach people who are incarcerated or formerly incarcerated, they're either in prison now or formerly in prison. So Ustad Amin, Amin Anderson, and he's been in prison for 28 years now. Uh, he should be getting out this uh, November. He became Muslim while in prison. And he converted to Islam. He, 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 he started studying. He knows Arabic. He can read texts in Arabic. He's translated Arabic into English uh, texts. He's written commentaries on books. MashaAllah, a phenomenal student and teacher. And we were discussing something about how sometimes people try to push Islam on other people and they end up pushing them away. They push Islam on people and they end up pushing them away. And so he said uh, this quote that really stuck with me, that truth without compassion is cruelty. Truth without compassion is cruelty. So in other words, just because we adhere to this notion as Muslims that yes, we, we speak the truth, even if it's bitter, we speak the truth against the oppressors, we speak the truth, we speak the truth, we speak the truth. At the same time, we can't always speak the truth without understanding what is that person, what am I, what is that person going through? What is their state at that moment? Because if I, if I go ahead and give too much at one time, or I give it in the wrong context, it might actually end up hurting that person. And I'll give you a, an example. Ikrama, radiallahu anhu, one of the Sahaba, one of the companions of the Prophet. Who is his father? Who is Ikrima's father? I think somebody said it over here, Abu Jahl, right? His father was Abu Jahl. Now you can imagine, imagine your father is Abu Jahl. Imagine Trump's son, you know, or let's not just pick on Trump, Obama, because Obama killed more Muslims than Trump. Bush, right? What if Obama's, one of Obama's daughters became Muslim and came into the masjid? You know, like, how would people, maybe not him, maybe Bush, or, you know, just, just think of somebody 
Bush, the Bush Jr. and Sr., one of their children, becomes Muslim. And we all know how many Muslims died at their hands. How would people look at them because of, you know, in relation to their fathers? Many people might accept them, but would there be something like that people might hold in their hearts? So obviously at the time of the Sahaba, they knew Abu Jahl and what he did. I mean, he, he killed the first person, right? Who did he kill? Sumayyah, radiallahu anha. So the first martyr in Islam was a woman, Sumayyah, and her husband, um, Yasir. And who killed them was Abu Jahl. So the first blood that was, well not the first blood that was shed, but the first person who died for Islam was Sumayyah. The first person who killed him, her was Abu Jahl. And we know all of the other things that Abu Jahl did. His son, Ikrimah, becomes Muslim. Well, some of the Sahaba started saying things about, you know, his father to him, and it really bothered him. And he came to the Prophet ﷺ and he complained about that. He said, they're saying things to me about my father. Like, wow, what's wrong with your father? Kind of, of a thing. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, um, he said, لا تؤذوا المسلمين بقربائهم الكفار Do not harm or bother or annoy the Muslims because of their non-Muslim relatives. So here's a situation where somebody might go and say up to Ikrimah and say, your father is one of the main kuffar of Quraysh. Is that true? Is that a true statement? Your father has really, really hurt the Muslims. Is that a true statement? Your father killed Sumayya. Is that a true statement? All these statements are true. But if somebody came to Ikrimah and said those things, would it really hurt him? So that's truth without compassion is cruelty. So we have to know what to say, when to say it, how to say it, who to say it to, and all of those things. So that's why it's important for us to understand how did the Prophet ﷺ teach other people? How did he convey the message? And this, in this, is the sunnah of the sunnah. The sunnah of the sunnah. So there are sunan, there are traditions of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, and there is a tradition, there is a sunnah to implement the sunnah. I'll give you another example. Eating dates. Is eating dates sunnah? What if somebody just grabbed a handful of dates and stuffed them in their mouth? Did they follow the sunnah of the sunnah? So that's a good way, like a good example to, rem to remember. Yes, eating dates is sunnah, but there is a sunnah to that sunnah. And to, to be able to, full, to, to fully implement that sunnah, we want to implement it in, in the prophetic way. So in the same way, when we convey the message of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when we convey the Quran, we want to do it in the, the prophetic model of, 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 of teaching. So a little bit about this seminar, uh, this seminar and the packet that inshallah, hopefully you'll all get into your hands once we can get those books here and um, everybody who's registered can get one of them. Um, the the years ago, um, one of the things that I noticed in, in sometimes how, how people teach, and again, I don't mean like a teacher in a formal environment of instructing, I'm just talking about how Muslims convey the deen, and how sometimes this, that sunnah of conveying is lost, even on myself. Like, okay, I can mention it, but am I, am I conveying the sunnah in the way that's as close as I can get it to the Prophet's way, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in the, the genre of, of literature about teaching and learning, there's a lot of books about adab of the student. Have you heard that topic or seen a book on that? Adab of the student, the etiquette of the student. One of the most famous texts in that is Zarnuji's book. It's called Ta'alim al-Muta'allim, Tariq al-Ta'allum. Teaching the student the method of learning. It was written about 500 uh, hijra, so almost a thousand years ago. And it's one of the books that we use in our... Um, correspondence course with the prisoners. It was one of the first books that we, that we taught them that before even teaching the sunnah, we're going to say, okay, let's teach you how to be a student. And this is Zarnuji's text, who's over a thousand years ago. And then after that, there's been a lot of books that were written on the adab of the student. Has anybody ever heard or either in a book or an article or a speech about the adab of the teacher? Anybody ever heard something like that? Like the adab of the teacher. So I started asking my question, myself this question, why is that? Why do we have so much literature and emphasis on adab of the student, adab of the student, adab of the student, but uh, the other way around, it's not there? Well, it is there. It's just not as common. And one of the reasons why is because, and I'll switch over to like the parent-child interaction. If we talk about hadith or ayahs that talk about respect of children towards the parents, which do we find more? 
Respect of children to the parents or respect of parents to the children? Children to the parents. Uh, I teach a book uh, also that we use it in, the, in, our, uh, in our course and it's available uh, for purchase online. I, tra I translated it. I, I don't have it. It's with another um, book distributor. Um, it's called The Rights of Parents. And it's a phenomenal book written by Sheikh Muhammad Mawlud. And in the book, he, taught, he brings all of the ayahs of the Qur'an and discusses them, all of the ahadith about rights of parents, stories of the early generations, the salaf. And then at the end, he has a section on the rights of children and how the parents should be. Now, it, the interesting thing is to watch when, I, when I've taught this to children in school settings and we spend weeks or maybe even a month or two going through rights of parents, rights of parents, rights of parents, right? And they, they're always asking, what about the rights of children? What about the rights of children? Like, it's coming. You're, we're we're going to get to it. It's the next to last lesson. We get to it, and it's just three lines. And they're like, oh, that's all we get? And in the, um, in the, in the, uh, in the, the sharh, in the, in the commentary, it says, well, one of the wisdoms in the sharia is that if Allah has already placed within us a natural inclination, there's not necessarily a lot of sharia rules about it. So I'll give you an example. Is drinking poison haram? Poisonous material. Is it haram? Have you ever heard a hadith that says, drinking poison is haram, this is what you get, this, you don't get it, right? But alcohol, we do have that, right? So why is there all of this, these ayahs of the Quran about alcohol and hadith about alcohol and punishments for the one who makes it and drinks it and so on and sells it and so forth, but there's nothing about poison. Well, the ulama said, because Allah has placed within us a natural inclination that's, that away from poison, that it's called al-wazir uh, al-shari, um, uh, al-wazir al-tab'i, basically the sharia preventative and the natural preventative. So if Allah has already placed within us a natural preventative, there's not much need for all of this literature, hadith and ayahs and so forth. It's there if somebody says, well, what's the hukum of it? What's the ruling of drinking poison? It's harmful to your health and therefore it's haram. But we don't, you don't, have you ever heard a khutbah says don't drink poison? Right? Even kids will get it. So that's bad, that's dangerous. But because human beings do incline towards alcohol, there's all, there's this literature about it because we don't have a natural, um, uh, deterrence from alcohol, then there's a sharia literature that acts as that deterrence. Does that make sense? So you'll see this theme within, within, within the sharia when you look at it holistically. That if there is a lot of illiterature about something, it's telling us about ourselves. That because we don't have that naturally within us and we might incline towards it, there's going to be these sharia injunctions, these sharia rulings, commands, reminders, ayahs, hadith. Does that make sense? And so in the parent-child relationship, who is more likely just naturally to do everything in their will and everything in their power to care for the other person? Who is the one who's going to run after the other person? Who's the one that's going to stay up at night and doesn't need a khutbah on the rights of children, right? That's the parent. Parents naturally are going to rush towards taking care of their children. Whereas children don't necessarily always have that. And by, when I say children, I could mean adult children as well. So it's not just like under 18. We're all children of, 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 of we, we have parents. And so we, we owe those rights to our parents, whatever age they are. And so just, I took a moment to, to explain that. Does that all make sense? That the, 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 the Sharia injunctions, the natural, the parent-child relationship. So similarly, what should be the case is that the teacher should be like the parent in this situation and the, and, the, and the student is like the child. So just like children need to hear these ayahs and these hadith about respecting the parents and honoring the parents, students generally would be more likely to not respect the teacher and so they need to hear this adab. What I've seen though is that there's a lot of times where teachers do not respect the, the, the student and it's not, it's not a one-for-one -one Similarity like I, I feel between parents and children So I think that it's more likely that a parent is going to respect the rights of their children than a teacher is going to respect the rights of their students And so for that reason I started looking I said, okay, where it, where can we find this in in our literature? So I found there was three books one of them which is the basis for this for this this book It's by Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghudda. Has anybody ever heard of him a great hadith scholar of the recent of the last century rahimahullah he passed away in i believe like 97 
or maybe 94, late, sometimes in the, somewhere in the 90s, he began a series of lectures about the, the Prophet وسلم, his method of teaching. And by the end of all of these lectures, he had collected 168 hadith, that each of them he could find something in there that shows how did the Prophet وسلم, teach. And then he took those 168 hadith and he made them into 40 different subjects. So like that 40 hadith type of genre of idea of here's 40 different ideas. Each one has about four, three to four supporting hadith. And so you get all of these hadith. I took that structure and I made it into a smaller outline that could be used by parents, by teachers, by any, in any learning community. And that's what this packet in this seminar is. Again, for those who came in late, we were supposed to have this packet here available for you so that while we're going through this, you could have it in your hands. Unfortunately, there was a mix up and it's not available. We'll try to get that to you. As long as you had signed up, um, we'll make sure to get that to you. So the basic one is called Rasul al-Mu'allim, the, the prophet teacher. It's available online as a translation called Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the perfect teacher. So if you have your phone, you can look it up. I believe it's available on Amazon. I would highly, highly, highly encourage everybody to purchase that book. Before that, you can just read through this, and we're going to go through as much as we can t t tonight. Um, you can read through it. It'll give you a general idea of the structure of all of the subjects. That book, Muhammad the Perfect Teacher, will be like a, a longer exposition of these, of these topics. That was one area. The other one is, um, it's an older book, Adab al-Ilm wal-Mu'allim wal-Muta'allim by Sheikh Abdul Basit al-Amlawi. Um, it's not available in, Engl in English. The section of the adab of the teacher is just a small section, but I included all of the relevant points from that. And then thirdly, um, a book called The Etiquette for Teachers and Students um, by, um, it's a collection of, of speeches from Maulana Ashraf Ali Tanwi, the great Indian scholar, Hakim al-Ummah from the last century, who, if you're not familiar with him or his works, I highly, highly encourage you to read um, his works. Actually, both of those scholars from the last century, Sheikh Abdul Fatah Abu Ghudda and Mulana Ashraf Ali Tanwi, rahimahumullah. Um, so it's based on that, plus some some uh, some some um, other things that I that uh, that I've uh, thought were beneficial. Again, the reason why I did this was because I saw that sometimes, in the process of teaching, the teachers forget why they're teaching it and how it should be transmitted, and and this is another very important point, that sometimes we build up models of education, whether in our homes, like with our children, in our schools, in our massages, the harakas, in our institutions, in our schools, at the larger level, at the university levels, the azhars of the world, and qarawiyin, and all of the other major institutions. So think of educational model as what happens in the home, how do you teach Islam to your children, to your community, the halaqas, the schools, the Islamic schools, the after-school programs, the Mekta programs, whatever it might be, all of those educational institutions that we build up, some have been going for years, some for decades, some for hundreds of years. One of the things that I found is that sometimes, and again, I'm not critical of the entire system, and we're not saying we're going away, but sometimes we need a tune-up. Just like our car might be running great, the system is, is fine, but then something builds up in it that's not supposed to be there, and we need to remove it. And I'm going to give you an example of that. Um, and so when we look at these institutions that have built, been built up for a long time for a purpose, to convey Islam, right? That's what we want to do for our children, in our masajid, in our halaqas, in our institutions. We're, we're, we're conveying Islam. We're convey, conveying the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But in that process, are we following the sunnah of conveying it? Are we conveying it like he would convey it? Um, to give you an example, there was, um, um, so there's a hadith, you may be familiar with it, where a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he, he said, I'm poor, I need money. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him, he said, do you have anything in your house, anything of value? And for anybody who knows this story, do you know what he brought? A pot. He said, I have a pot just like a clay pot. And you can imagine in those early simple societies, simple utensils like what this, we might get it at a at a, like this, this metal thing, we might get it at a, a dollar store, right? Now just because of mass production and globalization and so forth. But in earlier days, that would have been something that might be passed down a few generations. Um, in fact, one of my teachers, my, the Mauritanians um, who came here, one of my Mauritanian teachers who came to the US, somebody asked him, 
what's the most interesting thing you saw in the Bay Area? Imagine, he went from like a village in the deserts to the San Francisco Bay Area. And you know what the most, out of everything that he saw, and they in, the, as in between teaching and class, they took him to various things. You know what he found like the most interesting thing? Disposable cups. He's like, I, I just don't understand it. And I've lived in Mauritania for almost five years, and I've seen those pots, those wooden pots, the metal pots, and they're passed down, and they're used for years and years and years. Like the idea of throwaway stuff, it doesn't exist. Well, now it does because of globalization, globalization and modernization, but that's what stood out for him. So the Prophet ﷺ asked him, do you have anything of value? He brought a pot. The Prophet ﷺ took the pot to the masjid, and he auctioned it off. And he said, who will give me... Uh, something for this, one dirham, then somebody, he said, no more, somebody said, two dirhams, he sold it for that, he said, does anyone have an axe head, like the metal part of, a, of the axe, somebody said, yes, he said, I'll, I'll buy that from you right now, he said, now, and he told the person, get a pers uh, piece of wood, uh, because as long as you have that axe head, you can just affix any type of wood to it, he put the wood, he said, go chop wood in the mountains, and you can imagine, in, in Mecca, how, ma how many trees are there out there? right? You're going to have to really work to chop wood and to bring wood. People cook on fires um, and then sell that wood. Sometime later, he asked him how he's doing and he said he's doing well. He's, he, he, he's self-sufficient. So you can see what's going on in that hadith, right? The man was needy. He didn't just give him a handout. He basically, like the saying that's attributed to Isa, instead of giving a man a fish, you Teach him how to fish. And in this situation, teach him how to chop firewood. Well, fast forward, almost 1,400 years later, a friend of mine from the UK, he said somebody came to ask for help from the masjid. He said, why don't you just go chop some wood? Is that, did he convey the hadith? He conveyed one portion of it, but did he convey it in the way that the Prophet wasallam conveyed it? He didn't. So that's where, that's where sometimes like, okay, you have a, you have the, you, you've preserved this hadith, you preserve this idea, in whatever institution in your community or so forth, you have that, somebody comes in, you're like, here you go, go chop some wood. And so you haven't preserved the sunnah of the sunnah in that way. Another more recent example that, I, that, that comes to mind, a friend of mine, uh, a good friend of mine, he said he was talking with somebody from um, a, a certain Muslim country where they've really, I mean, a, a, almost every Muslim country has really perfected teaching kids to memorize the Quran, right? Wouldn't you say? Like you could go to pretty much any Muslim country, put your child into one of those systems of memorizing the Quran, and in a certain time, you know, uh, the other end of the, the, the factory, you're going to get your child who's memorized the Quran, right? But in that interim process of conveying the Book of Allah, could there have been some damage that's done? Right? There's documentaries online. You can look it on online. Look up this Al Jazeera docu documentary where they went undercover in some uh, Quran schools and just the horrendous things that happen. So now they're conveying the deen, but are they conveying it the way the Prophet ﷺ conveyed it to his Sahaba and his Sahaba conveyed it and so forth? So my friend was speaking to this person and the person asked him, so have you put your child into a Quran school? He said, no. And, and he said, oh, how old is she? He said, he said uh, whatever, she was over five. He's like, oh, that's it, too late. Over five, that's it. Because in their system, they've perfected a way that if you really want to get like perfection of the memorization of the Quran, you start at four and a half or five years old, and then, you know, by whatever age, they, 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 they give that to you. His response, he's like, so you're saying that after five, there's no hope for memorizing the Quran? He said, what about the Sahaba? Right? Because most of the Sahaba, if they memorize the Quran, did they do it as children or adults? adults. So in that, and I told the brother, I said, you know, what you did is, is basically what I'm trying to convey with this seminar, this educational seminar, that you put a check and balance into that system. Does that make sense? So that person's coming out of this long, hundreds, hundreds, centuries old methodology, this system that was built up to convey the sunnah, but in that process, he might have just lost one aspect of it. And so because now, whatever, over a thousand years later, now they're like, nope, the only way to do it, we only accept them if they're four and a half or five years old. Well, what about the Sahaba? So when you go back to the original source, that helps bring a check and balance to the system that you've built up to convey what they conveyed to us. Does that make sense? 
Okay, so that's why when we look at how the Prophet ﷺ taught, and as we go through some of these examples, think about, this is what I want you to do, think about situations where either you've conveyed something to somebody else, taught something to somebody else, or somebody taught it to you, and some of these elements were present. You're like, yeah, you know what, I had a teacher, and he or she did that. They really did that, and it really like resonated with me. And if you're okay sharing that, when we go to the section of uh, questions and answer, uh, Q and A and discussion, please share that. Or if somebody, it was a fail, like a success or a fail. Like, look, that person really didn't do that point, and it was just it did not land well. It ended up hurting more. Um, or a situation if we mention something that you're like, you know what, I've never experienced that either the lack of it or the presence of it, but I I know a good way to do this. So that's what. What I want you to be thinking about as you're listening is like, okay, practical implement, implementation of what, we're, of what we're talking about. So without further ado, I'm going to just jump right in. So I began by, by saying that every single one of us is a teacher by default. If you're a Muslim, you're a teacher. Because if we're a Muslim and we have to convey the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we're a teacher. So that's why it's important to learn this. More importantly, because the Prophet ﷺ, he himself was a teacher, the more we know about his teaching methods, the more we understand about him. And the more we get closer to him, the more understanding that we develop, the more love we will have for him by studying his, his sunnah, by studying his shama'il, things he did or he said or um, observed other people, uh, other people doing. So that's why, you know, that's just a, a response if somebody says, well, why should I be learning about this? Say, well, you want to know about your Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam more. And Allah says about him, That Allah is the one who sent amongst the unlettered people, the Arabs, an apostle from amongst themselves to recite to them his signs. يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ To recite the signs. وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ And to purify them. To purify their qualities and their characters and to teach them. وَيُعَلِّمُهُمْ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ And teach them the book and wisdom. And so if, if Allah is saying that this is, this is who the Prophet is, he's, he's going to recite to you the Qur'an, He's going to purify you and He's going to teach you the book. وَيُعَلِّمُهُمْ then that makes him a teacher. And so if we, if we see that one of, his, one of his qualities that Allah is addressing him as and describing him as as a teacher, then we know he's a teacher. In another um, story <coughs> or hadith, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came out from his rooms. You know his rooms were like, imagine if, so where is the qibla here? That way. Well, it's, it's at a corner. So let's just imagine, let's say the qibla is this way, okay? Where are his rooms? Right over there. So just, and, and this room is actually not much bigger than the original masjid. It's probably maybe double it, or even like just a half of it. So imagine this is the original masjid. So if you came into the original masjid, it's about this wide. Would you say this is about 90, 30, feet, 30 meters long? Yeah. Anyway, we can, we can do the, the, we know the, we know the dimensions. But it's about this size, maybe a little bit farther out that. So imagine you walk into the masjid, where you would see the Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam coming out is right through that door right there. There was like multiple doors to his rooms. That's where they were. They were stuck to the, to the masjid. Um, so just imagine that, the, the, the blessing of the Sahaba being able to come into the masjid and they just wait and the doors were just cloth. So he pushed the cloth away and there he is, sallallahu alayhi wasalam, walking out. And if his door was there and the mimbar uh, was over here, he would say that between his, his house and the mimbar is what? A a garden from the gardens of paradise. And some of the ulama said, because he said that, that that actual place will be lifted up when this dunya perishes and placed into Jannah as a garden. Like it's literally going to be a garden in the gardens of paradise. Others say, no, it's metaphorical that during this dunya, it's like a garden of the gardens of paradise. Ultimately, Allahu A'lam, uh, but it's a very, very special place. So once the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam emerged from one of his rooms, one of the Hujurat, and one of the surahs of the Quran is Surah Al-Hujurat. That's a, talking about those rooms. He saw two groups of people, two halaqat. He came to the first group and he asked them what they were doing. And they, they said they were, they were reciting Qur'an and supplicating, doing du'a. And he walked past them 
And then he asked the second halaqa, what are you doing? And they said, we are, um, we are, we are um, t engaged in learning and teaching. We're teaching the, the book of Allah, you know, talking about the ahkam and talking about theology, just like a, um, a, 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 a halaqa of ta'lim, of ilm. So the first one is a halaqa of ibadah, was a halaqa of worship. And the second one was a halaqa of ta'lim. He sat down with the, um, with the, the halaqa of, of learning. And he said, both are doing good. But I was only sent as a teacher. And so he sat with those who were, who were teaching and studying. In in Arabic means, الحصر, it means only. So that's why it will be translated like, not just verily I was sent as a teacher. معلمة, verily I was, I was sent as a teacher. I was only sent as a teacher. But again, he's, he's, he's affirming both of theirs, but he's sitting with the group of learning. So we know that he himself described himself as a teacher. <clears throat> okay, so one of the first things um, that they mention about the, the method of, of, of teaching is that the, the sunnah is to be gentle with the seekers of knowledge. To be gentle. And that's sometimes something we forget because of how, how important and valuable we know this deen to be and we want to convey it and sometimes in that fervor that we have to convey it we forget people are people they have feelings they have emotions and if we if we if we shove it down their throats they're not going to like it and one of the examples they say is that everybody loves food right if you say there's an event and free food right it's going to be packed there's a sir in there's a secret in that one of the first things, the foundations of Medina, right? Um, when the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina, we can look at that like for, when we study American history, it's like, okay, when they landed on Plymouth Rock and maybe made some, some announcements or we hold these truths to be self-evident, right? Okay, we're laying out what does it mean to be, what we're trying to do in this um, project called America. Well, in Medina, what were the first three orders when the Prophet ﷺ came? Uh, in, in, uh, the, not in the masjid, but then when he told the people what to do. Afshu salam. Spread salam. Atta'imu ta'am. Feed food. And then? And then sleep at night. Thank you. Jazakallah khairan. Sleep at night. Uh, sorry. Um, pray during the night when people are asleep. So spread salam. Social services, right? Or just... just uh, social, just uh, not social services, the food is social services, but this is just, just making people feel welcome and, and happy and bring, bring joy to the hearts of believers. One of the hadith says that the greatest, the greatest thing you can do after you fulfill your obligations, so imagine your five prayers and your hajj and your, sadha, your zakat and your Ramadan, the greatest thing, to bring joy to the heart of a believer. To bring joy to the heart of a believer. So that's why one of the ulama, Ibn al-Hajj, in his book, Al-Madkhal, says when you walk to the masjid, one of the many intentions that you can have is not just to pray, just to say, you know, if I see a Muslim, smile, ask them how they're doing, bring some joy to their heart. Just think about that. If you've ever met somebody at the masjid and you just took some time to speak with them, they're like, you made my day so much better. Or maybe it was you that your day got made so much better by the other person. That's a part of our deen as well. So that's ufshu salam, spreading peace and spreading salam, um, feeding people, and then, and then ibadah, not forgetting that that's an important part of our general ubudiyya, our general worship is to, um, is to, is to worship. So feeding is, is very important, and there's a secret in it. Would anybody like food shoved down their throat? Nobody. So again, going back to that idea that truth without compassion is cruelty. Honoring a person without compassion is cruelty. Shoving the food down their throat, they're not, nobody's going to like it. Throwing it in their face, nobody's going to like it. So you can take the most valuable thing, the Qur'an and the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and if we deliver it in a way that like is not honoring the person, then they could actually be repulsed by it. And Imam Al-Ghazali mentions this. He said, there are many people in this dunya who are not going to accept Islam because of the interaction of Muslims with them because of the interaction of Muslims with them. And there's a dua in the Qur'an where we ask Allah to say, Don't make us a tribulation for the disbelievers. 
and the biggest tribulation would then not be would then to not accept Islam. So we don't want to be in that situation. So one of the the secrets to do that is to be gentle with um, the seekers of knowledge. And the the hadith that Sheikh Abdul Fatah Abu Ghudda mentions here is the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave choices to his wives, and he said, Allah neither sent me as a person who causes difficulty to others, nor did He send me as one who who desires hardship and difficulty. In other words, I'm not I'm not I didn't bring this deen to make life hard for people. And I don't want to make them hard. Imam al-Ghazali says, this is a proof that a teacher should subtly remand the, reprimand the student. So when you reprimand somebody, try your best. Sometimes explicit reprimands are, um, are needed. And we also find that in the sunnah. But generally, the default is subtle reminders to the person. Because what it does for the listener is it allows them to keep their dignity. It allows them to like preserve the dignity because if we're always if there's always reprimand, then a person can lose their 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 self worth, their self their integrity. So to subtly reprimand the student, and to not resort to direct or explicit reprimanding, and to use kindness without scolding. And then he says, explicit reprimand destroys the veil of awe, meaning this heba. This uh, the the veil of awe or heba is basically the, that feeling that you have for another person to maintain the decorum in the interaction, to maintain that etiquette in the interaction. Like right now, everybody is, mashallah and jazakum Allah khair, I'm, I'm honored that you're silently listening to me as I present this. But what happens if there's a heckler, right? And what happened in that person's life to get them, him or her, to that point where they are okay with heckling? They've lost that heba for this maqam. When you go to the masjid for Jum'ah, everybody has that heba of the maqam of the khatib and the Jum'ah and the, the prohibition of speaking and so forth. And so everybody listens silently to the khutbah. Have you ever been in a khutbah where somebody like heckles the khatib? Anybody ever been in one? It's rare, but it happens, right? Right here it happened? Yeah, okay. Um, it happens. And so what happens in that situation is that the heba that respect, that respectful dignity that the person has, the, 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 respecting the sanctity and the dignity of that person or that maqam or that station has been removed. And so what Imam al-Ghazali is saying here is that if there's too much reprimand of the students, too much explicit reprimand and too much uh, degrading them, you will destroy the heba that that person has for you. Because eventually they'll be like, you know what? I respected you as my teacher, but I'm done. I'm fed up. And, and I guarantee you, once that, that heba is lost, it's almost impossible to bring it back. And I know some of you are shaking your heads because you know situations where, 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 where that heba has been destroyed between two people, between friends, teacher, student, maybe a spouse, parent and a child. But once it's destroyed, it's, like, it's almost like a bay'ah, an allegiance that that person gives to you and says, in this, you know, the understanding is, I'm going to respect you. As long as you, you know, maintain your, your respect of me. Once that bay'ah is done, it's like the khawarij. They're out there. It's like, I'm not going back. I learned my lesson. I got burned, and I'm not going back. So it, it can have a lot of um, um, negative um, impact. There was another hadith that's mentioned, um, and you might be familiar. It's a hadith in, in Imam Muslim, that a man came into the masjid, and he sneezed. And when he sneezed, oh, sorry, a man came into the masjid, who was um, uh, not familiar with all the rules. So he's praying in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. Somebody else sneezes. And so during the prayer, he says, Yarhamukullah. Now we know, right? You Generally, you're supposed to say, Yarhamukullah, but do you say it in the prayer? No, because we have this balance. We know that the sunnah is to say, Yarhamukullah, but there's a sunnah to that sunnah, which is in the prayer, you don't do it. So then he says, Faramani um, uh, al-qawmu him." They, people started like literally throwing their eyes at me, you know, could you imagine like just, just like, because you're in prayer, you can't talk. So they're just like, you know, glancing at him, cutting, uh, what do they say? Cutting um, with their eyes, right? What does it say? What is it saying? Is it side eye? Okay, yeah. So they're giving him side eyes, all this stuff. And he's looking at them. Um, and, uh, and then after the prayer, um, he said, L listen to this. Fabi ebi huwa wa ummi. Like, may my father and mother be sacrificed. It's a figure of speech. In other words, like, this is, I'm so 
What's that? Well, not humiliated, but just like whenever you, they say, Fabi ebi um, well, well, ummi, it's like, may my father and mother be sacrificed. Like it's a, it's a, it, it was a way to like emphasize, like what I'm about to say is true and I'm willing to sacrifice my parents for this statement. He said, Ma ra'aytu mu'alliman qablahu wa la ba'dahu ahsana ta'aliman minhu. I have never seen a teacher before him or after him who, who uh, be, uh, uh, a person teach in a better way than him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Fawallahi, by Allah, ma kaharani. He did not. Um, uh, he did not scold me. Wala uh, darabani. He did not hit me. Wala shatamani. He did not uh, curse me. Qala, and what he said to him, he said, Inna hadhihi salat la yasluhu fiha shay'un min kalam al nas. Inna ma huwa tasbih wa takbir wa qiraat al Quran. This is a prayer that you cannot have conversations with, and yarhamukullah is a type of speaking to another person. It's for qira uh, of the Quran and doing tasbih and takbir. So this was this was a person who is now attesting to how great of a teacher he was, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. About this hadith, Imam Nawawi says there's, a, there's so many things we can derive just from this hadith. But he says the first thing is that the grand character that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, had, which Allah bore witness to. Like one of the things that Allah attests to him is that you are upon a grand character. And we have to pay attention to how is Allah describing the Prophet ﷺ in these various verses of the Qur'an. What is he saying about him ﷺ? If he's telling us by, by addressing him and says, you have a grand character, that now we know that this is an affirmation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not just the people around him who knew him as as sadiq al-Amin, right? The truthful one, the trustworthy one. Even the, Qura, uh, the, uh, the Quraysh knew that. Um, even non-Muslims, recently I was reading a, a collection of sayings of, of people, just historians who have looked, and you look at the way, what they're, how they speak about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and how they're like, the, his character, his character, his character. So the Muslims witnessed his, to his characters. Quraysh, his enemies witnessed to his character. But even more important than that, Allah bore witness to that character. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٌ عَظِيمٌ Verily you are upon a grand character. Imam Nawawi says about this hadith, it also shows us, his gentleness with the ignorant ones. In other words, this person came into the masjid, he's not familiar with it, with the rules and the etiquettes and the adabs and the rules of prayer. He didn't say, what's wrong with you? Why didn't you study? Go over and then teach him. He was gentle with him as he explained it to him. And the person was allowed to maintain their, their self-worth and their dignity. His kindness and compassion for his nation, his ummah. A lesson to follow his example in being easy with the ignorant ones teaching them in a beautiful way, being gentle with them, making them understand the correct thing to do. These are the kind of things that as a parent, as a teacher, halaqa leader, khatib, like it would be good, not good, necessary for us to review this before we engage in teaching, before we go out there to do da'wah, to, to remind ourselves of like, okay, we're conveying this deen, we're conveying his sunnah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but how do we do that? How are we going to, to convey them? Um, in, the, in this way. There's another hadith, um, and it has a lot of rulings, so I'll just start off with that. Um, if you laugh during prayer, do you still have wudu? Some people say yes, no. What's that? You have wudu, but your prayer is invalid. What's that? Shafi'i. Okay, so there's a difference of opinion amongst the madahib. So in the Maliki school, as the brother uh, mentioned, your, your, your wudu is valid, but your prayer is invalid. Is that the same in the Shafi'i too, right? Yeah, same as Shafi'i. Maliki and Shafi'i is the same. The Hanafi school says not only is your prayer invalid, your wudu is, in prayer. Uh, your wudu is invalid as well, laughing during prayer. Well, where do we get these? You know, sometimes people hear the difference of the madahib and they're like, why can't we just have one rule for everything? Well, let's take a look at this hadith. Let's see where the mujtahideen, Malik, Shafi'i, Abu Hanifa, where does this begin? Well, it begins, and it's, it's, a, it's a testament as well to what we're talking about here, how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was with, with his students. So, um, he said, uh, or, there was a group of people praying behind him. During the prayer, somebody passed wind. And then some of the other people laughed at that. You could just imagine, right? Like it, it will ha it's human nature, and it's human nature to laugh. After the prayer, the Prophet ﷺ said, 
Repeat your will do and your prayer, all of you. Repeat your will do and your prayer, all of you. Abu Hanifa looked at this and he says, okay, I can see what's going on here. The one who passed wind, yeah, that breaks his wudu. Those who laugh during prayer, laughing in prayer breaks your wudu. Others like Imam Shafi'i and Imam Malik said, no, 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 this is, this is not, that's not what's going on here. This is setr. And they actually refer to this as hadith of setr. The, the hadith of veiling or concealing. And so what he was doing when he sent everybody to renew their wudu, what happened there? He didn't out him. Because if he said, okay, you, whoever broke their, broke their wudu, go do your wudu. And the rest of you, you laughed in prayer, so wait for him to come. Like, they would know who did that. So this is called hadith al-satr. Now, in that, where you can see the rules that are, like, the fiqh is one discussion. The other thing, the principle there, regardless of, of Maliki, Shafi'i, Hanafi ruling that, that's derived and what a person chooses to follow, that message of, con, con, you know, veiling the person and honoring them and veiling their, and for their, the preservation of their dignity, that's all the same, right? That's not lost in that fiqh discussion, right? Um, and to give you an example, one of my teachers, our main teacher, Murabat al-Hajj Hafidh al-Urm, rahimahullah, he's passed away in 2017, almost six years ago, it was in July. Um, in, in, uh, in the days before, actually even up until very recently, people would copy out books by hand. And even when I was there, I was started going to Mauritania in 1998, on the weekend, some of the students, that's what they would do. Because they didn't have access to print shops, Photo, uh, photocopy places or bookshops. So if somebody wanted a commentary of a book, they would sit there on the weekend and, you know, just talk with each other and just copy out a book by hand. It might be 10 pages, 20 pages, 500 pages. I know one person who copied out a book by hand. He said it took him six months. And then that's the book that he's going to study from. Then he will give it to somebody else. Um, so that, that tradition was still going. Now it's, 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 it's not as much because, um, just because of the the availability of copying machines and, and, and bookstores and so forth. At the time earlier, like say in the 50s, 60s, 70s, it was almost non-existent. So they're, they're getting paper was very rare. And then copying out the books was a long process. So you can imagine if somebody has a handwritten copied book that's written in a natural charcoal ink that if you spill water on it, it's going to bleed to preserve and then they also didn't bind it so they would they would have it in leather like leather bind so if the wind comes and like uh, and i've seen this happen the person's opening their their book a, a, a strong wind comes and then there's there's paper all over this the, the place i've seen it multiple times quran students they're reviewing using their a mushaf there's no binding on it uh and uh, you know those dirt devils or whatever they call them, um they, they come through and it'll just then you see paper everywhere and then you see the quran students running after their papers to put them together so so it's, it, they're, they're very delicate. So the teachers would loan out their books to their students. Murabat al-Hajj had loaned out his books to some of the students, and they didn't um, take care of it. And so he's looking through one of his books. Some of the other students are around him. And, and, he, and he just says, you guys need to take care of my books. You know, I, I take, a lot of, uh, take a lot of time. So he just gave him a, a reminder, like, please take care of my books. The students who were the perpetrators left. And the, 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 the serious student who really took care of the books, he was still there. And, but he, got, he was involved in this general reprimand. And then Murabat al-Hajj asked him, he says, Oh, Fulan, you know, so-and-so. He says, you know Hadith of satr right? He said, yeah. He said, Kadalika. He said, you know that Hadith of satr Like, in other words, I know you take care of the books. And I wasn't talking to you, but I didn't want to out them and leave you because then that would cause like some animosity between between the students so that's hadith al-satr um, now how we implement that think about it for a moment like how can i do that in my life how can i do that with my children with my students with other people that I, maybe i want to teach them how is a way that i could convey a message they get the message but that dignity is preserved so that's one thing you know if you if you think about it and you want to share um when we um what time is oh maghrib is in about six minutes um, actually, let's stop right there. Does anybody have any um, thing they'd like to share about so far what we began with or an idea of how that can be implemented in a modern context? Or any questions so far? Okay. All right, then I'll end on this session and we're co we'll come back after Maghrib. Um, we're not going to get through this whole, this whole packet. And again, we'll, we'll, we'll do our best to get this packet into your hands. What I want you to do when you finally get this packet, 
is to read through the whole thing and read through it not feeling that, oh, I need a teacher to go through it line by line with me. Because what I want you to see, and that's what I'm just going to take, some of these hadith, like as I'm sharing, they're pretty self-evident, right? As I'm sharing it, you're like, okay, I see that lesson. Now the difficulty is how can I bring that lesson into my life? We can all do that. There's one thing that we cannot do when we're, when we're, when we're doing self-study, which is extracting rulings. تخريج الأحكام. That's a separate subject. So like the hadith of Satr, what Malik and Shafi'i and Abu Hanifa did in terms of extracting rulings, that's the purview, the job of the mujtahideen, of the fuqaha, the jurists who have reached that level, that they can look at something and they can extract the rulings. So when I'm encouraging you to read these hadith, I'm not en encouraging you to say like, okay, I'm going to see this is halal, this is haram, this is makru, based on that. That's not what we're, that's not what our job. Our job is now to say like, okay, on the moral side, the ethical side, how can we bring the principles of, like, say, for example, that hadith of Satr into our lives? Does that make sense? So as you're reading the, through this, you'll see that a lot, the, the majority of this, it's, it's going to resonate. You, you don't need a teacher. You don't need a teacher. So what I'm doing in this seminar is really more inspirational rather than informational. I want you to feel confident that you can take this home and you can read through it. And you're like, okay, that makes sense. You might have some questions, some clarifications. And I'll open up, you know, through email if you want to send an email to me, you know. But I think even in, in a discussion, you'll be able to, 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 to understand most of it. And then to be um, encouraged to buy the original book that this was based on, Sheikh Abdul Fatah Abu Ghudda's book that's um, translated in English as the perfect, Muhammad, the perfect teacher. And then read through it and see how can I bring this into my life. Because, and this is where I'll end before Maghrib, you will be able to uncover things when you're reading the Qur'an or reading hadith, that maybe nobody else has uncovered before. I'm going to say that again. You might be able to uncover things in the Qur'an or in the hadith that nobody else was able to uncover before. Again, not ahkam. We're not talking about rulings. We're talking about insights into what's going on here. And this is something that Ibn al-Hajj says, one of the miracles of the Qur'an is that every generation will uncover things that the previous generations didn't. We're not talking about a new theology or a new fiqh, ahkam. That has already been established. We're just talking about those insights. And I'm going to give you um, a couple of stories to, to show you how that's happening. Um, the Prophet wasallam was excelled at everything, right? Being a teacher, being a father, being a husband, being a friend, being a, a military leader, being a, a, a countryman, establishing a country, inspiring people, inspiring leaders teaching people, purifying everything. He was also the most physically fit, right? He was the greatest warrior himself, not just in, in sending others out to battle. Well, there was a champion wrestler who came and wanted to wrestle the Prophet ﷺ. And they wrestled, and who won? The Prophet ﷺ. And then what did he ask? Hmm? What did the wrestler ask for? A rematch. He wanted a rematch, and so he wrestled him again, and he beat him a second time. Now, most of the time, and even when I first heard this hadith, like what's immediately gained from that is that, oh wow, the prophet was, you know, great. He could even beat the champion wrestler, right? Like, um, and it makes us feel good. Like when we see Habib and what he did, Hafizullah, may Allah preserve him and his family, we're like, yes, a Muslim did that. A Muslim did that. Um, and so when we hear the prophet doing that, like, we're like, yes, Rasulullah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that too. There was a wrestler one time listening to this. He said, I know why he asked for a rematch. And up until this point, you know, most people might have, that, that I heard discussed that is like, oh, he, he didn't want to lose his title. He wanted the rematch. He's like, no, no, no. As a wrestler, looking at that, I know what he was doing. As a wrestler, he, if he was a champion, the first time he got lost, he knew he was beat. He knew that's it. I'm no, I'm no longer the top. This person the top. The, 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 the rematch, he wanted to know how he did it. So now that wrestler might have given insight to that hadith story that for the past 1400 years as it was transmitted, nobody ever saw that. Maybe they did, Allahu Alam. But a wrestler looking at that, he's like, oh, I see what's going on here. If you're a parent, you know when you read certain hadith, you can say, oh, I see what's going on here. As a friend, if you have a close friendship, if there's a hadith about friendship, you know what's going on here. So I'm, I'm saying that to preface that as you're going through this, that's what I want you to do. I want you to look for those gems and those jewels in that way. Again, 
We're not looking for a new theology. Our aqidah is established and firm. Alhamdulillah, there's no changing it. Our fiqh, our sharia is established and firm. We don't need to, we don't need to do that. But we can find these jewels. Um, there was another man who came into a setting, um, a sitting, a gathering of ulama. And up until that point, all of the, this was very early on, like within the first few hundred years, all of the tafsirs of the Quran, when they got to the section of Surah Al-Rahman, يُخْرَجُ مِنْهُمَ الْلُؤْلُؤُ وَالْمَرْجَانِ that Allah takes from them too, the salt and the fresh water, pearl, pearls and coral, right? Lu'lu wal marjan. Well, the Arabs in those early times <clears throat> and the early Muslims, they only knew coral and pearls from salt water. Now, we all know about freshwater pearls, right? But in the early generations, they didn't know that. So there was actually, if you look in the early tafasir, when they get to this, they're like, wait a minute. Um, Allah is telling us that he takes pearls out of both waters, but experientially, we only see him coming out of the salt water. So they give a linguistic commentary to that. There was a man who um, came with a freshwater pearl. He came into a gathering of ulama, and he said, I am a just witness, and I bear witness that this came out of fresh water. You need to change that tafsir and your understanding of that. So again, this is a, a story of like how we can change um, understandings. It's not ruling or it's not changing our aqidah. It's not changing our fiqh. It's not changing our theology or, or our, our law. Another story, um, up until very recently, the ayah that says, um, Surah Al Hadid, the chapter of iron. How does Allah describe iron, the introduction of iron to earth? Wa anzalna al Hadid. We have sent down iron. Well, the early people, they dug iron out of the grounds, right? The iron ore. So they're like, well, Allah is saying we've sent it down, but we dig it out from the ground. What does anzalna mean? They're like, oh, it must mean avharna. You know, so they gave a ta'wil to it. But what would we say now? Hmm? Meteorites, right? So now we have a modern understanding where, again, it's not changing our theology or our law, our aqid or our fiqh, but it is saying, hmm. We now, we've uncovered something that the earlier generations didn't know an insight about that hadith. Um, so with that, that's why when we're reading this, uh, reading these hadith about the Prophet Wasallam and how he interacted with other people, um, some of the, the lessons are going to be straightforward. At the same time, you can also say, all right, how can I, how can I bring these into my life? How can I bring life uh, to, to, these, uh, to these sunnahs? And we'll stop right there because I know they're about to give adhan and um, uh, if anyone needs, needs to make wudu and then we'll pick up after Maghrib inshallah. Oh, there, quick question? Yeah. Okay, yeah. The question was, so in my experience, how much does the, this, the pre preservation of, of, of dignity affect little kids? Um, and I would say it's, it's very important. Very important. And any of the other parents are, who are here, teachers, you know, and it's probably, I could venture to say it's more important than with adults. Because with the children, they're still, they're still forming their identity. They're still understanding the way the world works, the modeling that happens. You know, there's this bumper sticker that says, everything I, uh, everything I need to know I learned in kindergarten. I love that bumper sticker, right? Um, uh, which I also found out, uh, I, I found this other bumper sticker that I like, which is, it'll be a great day when, um, when the schools get all of the money they need and the army has to have, uh, or the military has to have bake sales. Well, the person who wrote both of those, same person I found out. He's got a, a series of articles. So um, everything I learned, I, I learned in kindergarten. And most of our socialization happens between like three to five years old. Three to five years old socialization. So when we look at the problems in society, like say authoritarian regimes, we can trace it back to authoritarian households. And so if the, if the, if the, if the parents in those households are like in, their, in the marketplace, they don't uh, respect the dignity of other people. You know, they're talking down to this person. They're doing that. The kids are learning that. And so the same thing with the dignity. Like the dad, it's, um, you know, stuff rolls down, right? Like if the, if, the dad's, if the leader is not respecting the dignity of the people under him, eventually it's going to run down to the leaders of the company, down through all the managers and the supervisors, down to, to, to the worker. Then he or she takes it home, and then it keeps going down. Then it's going to go from the, from the kids, then to the cats. And the pets, right? That's it'll it, it'll it'll go down th that way. So it is. It's um it's um it, it's it's extremely important. And if we see the way the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam how he dealt with children, you see this like this honoring of children that the Arabs didn't have at the time.
compassion. This honoring and compassion. So we know he would kiss the children. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And also, Allah uh, Akbar. Yes. Well, All right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ahli wa ashabi ajma'in. Um, we ended with the point about gentleness. Does anybody have any questions or comments maybe about, about that point? Other hadith that maybe come to mind about his gentleness, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Anything you want to share? One thing that came to... Oh, yes. So the question was, um, and correct me if I'm wrong in summarizing, but there are certain disciplines, like say, for example, sports, where you might require certain firmness, um, in, in, in conveying that and what would be my opinion. I think that it's, it's not either or, it's both and. So it's, it's, you, can, you can teach, you can have firmness and still be gentle at the same time. Um, what's, the, it's, it's the firmness with the harshness. So you can de de deliver a very difficult message, but we all know like either you've been on the receiving end of somebody who's, who's, who's delivered some very difficult, you know, information that you need to know or advice that you need to hear but if they've done it in a way that's caring and respecting and gentle it just lands a lot better as opposed to just like um not caring about that and i think even in in, the, in those disciplines like whether it's um coaching or any type of coaching if the coach is well here i'll, I'll back up one that <clears throat> there was a um there's a researcher who wanted to find what's the magic bullet in education what is that one thing that if we did would give our students so much more success. So she looked into extra testing and uniforms and after school programs and year round school and summer school. You know, everything that everybody says like, oh, you know, extra, uh, um, what is it called? Training for the teachers and after school support and tutoring, whatever, everything somebody says, you know, if we just did this, our schools would be so much better. Our students would be so much more successful. You know what she found after looking at all of the various studies, the number one thing that actually had the most impact care care so it's not about the teachers um training themselves they could have graduated from harvard and any other ivy league school but if they don't come into that teaching environment with care and they show that care because especially little children they'll pick up on that real quick right all the parents in here you know like if you've had little kids they can they they almost it's like they send out feelers like is this person like relatable fun and if you just give them a little bit then they'll just like open up but if a person if the adult is 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 reserved then they're like okay i know i can't talk to that person or laugh or joke around that person so they're very very attuned to those subtleties we have it as adults as well but children have have like i think an extra dose of that maybe it's a survival function allahu alam but once they feel once a student or anybody feels that you care about them the whole relationship cha changes so what i would say about that firmness is if if there's the there's that you've already established this rapport with the person you they know you care about them so they know that that firmness is going to come from a place of of care and concern and if it's coming with care and concern it's going to be delivered like not with that with with a harsh or a, a snappy attitude or a snappy comment right so it's they know the platform is care and then it's coming in with, um, it's, it's going out with care. It might still be firm, but they know it's care. Uh, there's been research on parents who have more, um, like the, the, the disciplining of children, whatever it is, whether it's verbal reprimands or if a person chooses physical reprimands, you know, in, in rare instances with, you know, according to the sunnah, according to the law, all of them, I'm not going to get into all of those, but how, regardless of how a parent chooses to discipline their, their child, and everybody says, you know, if you just did this more with the child, it would be, it would be better. If you just did this more. The, the difference is, as long as the child knows that the parent cares about them, and the parent actually tells them, listen, I'm doing this discipline, whether it's grounding, taking away things, giving them a verbal reprimand, whatever it might be, as long as the children knows the base on this interaction, this relationship that we're operating on, is that the parent truly cares about me and cares about me for my success, then it just lands a lot, a, a lot better. Uh, with, there's, there's much more success with that. And with the delivery, if it's coming from a point of care, it's not going to have that, that element of harshness in it. And one thing that comes to mind is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran speaks to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, if you were fadban, ghalid al-qalb, if you were harsh and hard-hearted, and he uses both of those. If you were harsh and hard-hearted 
what would the reaction of people be to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? They would have ran away from you. Now we have to really think about this because this is the greatest of creation. This is Khairu Khalqillah, the greatest human being to ever walk on this earth. The greatest messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa The Habib of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, I mean, we could just go on and on about how great he is, sallallahu alayhi wa Even if he was harsh and hard-hearted, people would have like ran, ran away from that. So now when, um, when, we, when we're trying to convey this, this deen, we can't come with the attitude of like, well, it's the haq, it's truth. How many times have you heard that? Somebody says, you know, brother, you know, sister, you might have said that a little bit more, you know, it's the truth, it's the haq, and I speak the truth, and I'm a Muslim, and I speak, how many of you heard that? Somebody say that, right? That attitude. And so it's like, well, that's not what Allah is telling us about the Rasul. He's not, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. he's not just saying, yeah, speak the truth. He's like, deliver the truth, and you're not hard-hearted, and you're not harsh. And because of those two qualities, that's why they're not running away from you. It's not like, okay, he's got the truth. So the same thing, the coach on the, uh, on the field, the teacher in the classroom, the parent in the home, you can deliver those messages, sometimes with firmness, sometimes with sternness, but if you're harsh or hard-hearted, oh, it's, gonna, it's, gonna, it's not going to end in good results. Um, one, <clears throat> so this, this packet, inshallah, everybody will eventually get into their hand. Um, what's that? Uh, what if you have both approaches and... Same thing, and then again you're upset, and then again the second time you're kind of reprimanding them for that for it, and then even then they don't understand. It yeah. happens usually. Yeah, and and that is there. There's something to be you know said about that, um, and and what I would respond is that when it comes to application and how we apply this. Now, this, that's not my job to tell you or to, tell, or to be the expert. I'm not the expert. I'm just, we're, we're, we're working as a group to see, all right, how did the Prophet ﷺ, how did he reprimand people? How did he interact with people? And now let's, as a, as a community, say, share with each other, all right, now, how do we bring this into our household, especially with a child that might be uh, resistant? And we've tried multiple approaches. And so now we need to, we need to figure this out. I don't have the answer. Um, and that's where, I mean, we can bring in people who are experts on child raising, parents who have raised children, who have grandchildren. I mean, we can have all these different voices as long as we're saying like, okay, let's use this as our guidelines and now figure out how we're going to take that and apply it into our situation. So I know that's not the answer that you're probably looking for. I can't give the answer. I don't know in that specific situation. What I hope is that we go with a little bit more insight and a lot of inspiration to say like, okay, now I know the general framework. Now my challenge is to bring this to life in my life. And there's no guidebook on how to do that. That's where the ijtihad is going to come, come in. And by ijtihad, I don't mean extracting the rules. I mean like, what are you going to do in that unique situation at that very moment in time? As long as you have a lot to work with, you have a higher success of doing like, doing your, 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 you do your due diligence. So you study, you seek counsel, you reflect on it, you ask other people, and then when it comes time to make a decision, you put your best foot forward and you just say, tawakkal to Allah. And we don't know what's going to be, and it's difficult, like, especially in raising children, it is, it's, it's a fitna, right? It's a, it's a test, it's a trial, it's a tribulation. So I don't know the answer. Um, uh, what I would say is that when we, and we'll, we'll, we'll see some of these other uh, situations, these other stories, like there are stories where the Prophet ﷺ was a little bit more stern with his companions. So we have the general gentleness, but there were also some of these other uh, situations. So actually, that'll go into this next one. This is a longer hadith, so I'm going to, to paraphrase it. Um, and basically what this hadith is talking about, it's narrated by uh, Munziri and Al-Haythami, um, where there was a group of people who were new to Islam and they did not know much about Islam. And they lived outside on the outskirts of Medina and they, their, their, their area of Medina, which to give you an idea, if you've been to Medina or if you've seen the um, pictures of it, the current masjid and the courtyard is basically the old city of the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And if you go like, imagine this is the courtyard... Okay, let's just say this is the courtyard. This is the beginning, because now it stretches really far back, right? So if this is the front of the masjid, back here on the western corner, there's called um, the Saqifa Garden. Has anybody been to that or seen it? If go to the, 
northwest corner, the western corner, it's called the Saqifa Garden. That's the garden where the Sahaba gave bay'ah to Abu Bakr, Siddiq radiallahu anhu. The garden is still there. Everything is developed around the garden is still there. Not the original plants, but the garden is there. And I, on this last Umrah in Ramadan, I went to, I just stood there at the, 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 the gate around, and I just tried to picture, like, those stories that we hear of the Sahaba and the giving the bay'ah, that happened there. Over here, there's Masjid Ghumama. That was the masjid where they would pray Eid in. And the sunnah for Eid is to go outside the city limits. It's right here on the edge, the outside of the, the courtyard. That was outside the city limits. That was where they prayed uh, Eid, and that's also where the Prophet ﷺ prayed the janazah on and Najashi. Over here is what? Baqir. Al Baqir al Gharqad. The, the, the cemetery, which if you read the Sira literature, you had to go outside of the city to the, to, the, to the cemetery. Now it's just, you go outside of the courtyard and into the, to, to the cemetery. I'm just mentioning that to say that like, when we talk about Medina and the city, it wasn't the sprawling metropolis that we have now. It was very, very small. So outside the city limits, there lived this group of people. <clears throat> they lived next to um, uh, a group of people called the Ash'ariyin. The Ash'ariyin, not the Ash'aris, like the Aqidah of the school of Aqidah. The Ash'ariyin, who is a famous Sahaba that's from the Ash'ariyin? Just think of like he's a Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. You hear that name, right? Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, on the authority of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. He was from the Ash'ariyin. The Ash'ariyin were known as a, as, a, as a group of people who really were committed to knowledge. They made it the culture of their, their, their tribe their sub-tribe, to be committed to knowledge. And we see this in various families across history, in various tribes, and various cultures. In Mauritania, where I studied, there were, um, there, there were actually different tribes. Some are known to be craftspeople. Some are known to be herders. And they're just like, that's all we do. We just herd goats and sheep and everything. If you want to herd, the best herder, go you know, to, the, uh, to that group. If you want the, the craftspeople, you go to that group. If you want the warriors, the Beni Hassan, that all they, you know, they're, they're having all these intertribal uh, conflicts um, and they have the focus on getting date palms and, um, and, and guns and just you know, weapons of war, that's the Beni Hassan. The Zawaya tribes, what do you think their focus was? Ilm, knowledge. They said that they, that's our pride. To the point that up until very recently, it was almost impossible for a young man from the Zawaya tribe to get married if he had not studied, if he had not memorized the Quran. Like you know how it is in our society now. It's like you got to have a job and a degree from a university, right, to basically propose to somebody. Well, in their tribe, it's like you have to have memorized the Quran. And some of them, they said you have to study risala in fiqh, um, intermediate level fiqh. Like that's our our our. Um, and then, and I would hear people, they would, they would reprimand, not reprimand, but just gently remind people like, hey, you're a little bit too focused on the, uh, on the dunya. Remember, you're a Zawi, you're from the Zawiya tribe. So there's this constant like re-emphasis of that's who we are. That's our pride. We are people of knowledge. Um, it's, it's fading away and it's actually shifting to other groups of people. And it's interesting to see that sociological, uh, sociologically, just to see how that, that's happening. In any case, um, the Ash'ariyin were known that knowledge was important for them. They spent a lot of time learning. Their neighbors, they complained to the Prophet ﷺ. They said, the Ash'aris don't have time for us. They're not teaching us. They're not bringing us out of, uh, of ignorance. So what does the Messenger of Allah ﷺ do? One day, the Messenger of Allah ﷺ addressed the people. He praised Allah and he exalted him. Like a khutbah, right? In alhamdulillah, in ahmadu wa nasta'inu. He then mentioned some groups of Muslims and spoke highly of them. And then he says, مَا بَالُ أَقْوَامِ what, what do some people think? That they do not educate their neighbors. They don't explain to them. They do not command to good. They do not prohibit them from evil. And what do you think about some people? They don't learn from their neighbors. They don't educate themselves. They don't try to understand them. And I take an oath by Allah that, 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 that people should certainly teach their neighbors, educate them, make them understand, command to good, and prohibit evil. And people should certainly learn from their neighbors, educate them, and try to understand from them. If not, I anticipate punishment for them in this world. And that was the end of the khutbah. So, and I, I wrongly said that the, that the other people had complained to the Prophet ﷺ. He had just, he had, he had heard that they weren't learning and these weren't teaching. And so he rebuked them both, but he didn't name them by names. He said, مَا بَالُ أَقْوَامِ 
And this is one of the sunnahs of the, the prophetic da'wah. He would not out people or groups by name. He would just say, what do you think about certain people? Because what happens, what happened after that, and this is what the ulama say, that when you, when you speak in generalities, the people who need to hear that message, if they're smart and they reflect, they're like, oh yeah, he's talking about us. That's us. And that's exactly what happened with the Ash'ariin. Um, so then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entered his house. And remember, this is, if, this was the, if this room was the masjid, where is his house? Right there. Right, right over there. Um, and so <laughs> the, um, some people said, who do you think he was referring to? They said, like, they're like, okay, that was, that was definitely not a general. There was somebody he was talking to. And then somebody says, we think that he was talking about the Ash'ariin because they're very learned and their neighbors are um, they're unlearned and they live in the oasis like the, 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 the Bedu. The Ash'ariin the heard about this and they came to the Prophet وسلم, and they said, you described some people as good and you described us as, as bad. What have we done wrong? And then he said, people should certainly educate their neighbors. The hadith goes on, it's longer, but you get the idea. The idea was... He sent out the message and he said, ma balu aqwam. He just said, in, in general. What that also does, it, it, it allows the person to develop their own understanding of like, okay, he said this and this is what we do. There's more reflection. There's more self-reflection. There's more introspection as opposed to a, a, a dictate being issued. Oh, Ash'ariin over there, you guys teach those other people over there. It's just a command. You don't, you don't help the person develop that introspection. Um... And so this was that was one of his, that was one of his um, um, his methods of teaching. Sheikh Abdul Fatah Abu Ghudda says about this hadith. He says this show this hadith is a, is a, a proof that the shortcomings in teaching and learning are a social crime. The shortcomings in teaching and learning are a social crime. This is what the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam knew from the very beginning. We are the Ummah of Iqra. We are the Ummah of seeking knowledge. And so wherever you we we went. There was this emphasis on knowledge, and not just knowledge of the of, of the deen, knowledge of everything. So there's we have to constantly remind ourselves and renew it with our children, the people who come into the faith. This is this is who we are. This is what we are about. At Tayba Foundation, one of I mean our main area of teaching is teaching people in prison. And one of one of my students who I've been teaching for about ten years, his name is Ahmed, and may, may Allah give him freedom. He has a life without parole sentence. In other words, he can't get out. And the two main witnesses that, that put him at the scene of the crime, even though he was on the other side of the city, they both came forward and they said, we lied. And, it, I mean, he's, he's a victim of shahadat al zawr like the, the false testimony. And still the district attorney is putting so many hoops to jump through to, to get, that, uh, that, get that reversed. Um, so... But in spite of all that, in spite of being in prison over 20 years, losing his wife, losing his children, uh, losing his freedom, uh, he's still always upbeat, always smiling. Uh, if you type in his name, Ahmed Adisa, you'll see some, there's a, a short documentary. It's on our website as well, Taiba's website. But he's always smiling, always in, 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 in good spirits. And um, what was I, why was I mentioning that? Oh, okay. So he said before he was Muslim, he was always, he was always a good student. But he said in his, in his neighborhood and in his classrooms, people would tease him for being a good student. And they would, they would call him names and they just, it was, it was just in his school, in his area, there was like, it wasn't cool to be a, to be a good student and to be good at, uh, at studying. And so he fell off, he let his uh, education go to the wayside. When he became Muslim, and now he sees the emphasis on knowledge, he said, I was able to um, reclaim that part of who I was, like being a very astute student. And now when people say, oh, why are you studying? Are you trying to be like, you know, the oppressors or be like other people who you are not and, you know, not your people? He said, no, no, I'm Muslim. I'm Muslim. And this is part of our religion. This is part of our pride of who we are. We study, we learn, we teach. Um, he studied one of the books that we teach about, the, um, uh, about prayer. It's called the Mukhtasar of Akhdari. And in that is a section about telling the times of prayer. And it through the sun, like the, the sh learning the when the sun reaches the the the, the zenith, the zawal, knowing when dhuhr enters asr, maghrib, like it's something that we should all learn. It's so important. Imam Malik put that as the first section in his book of hadith, the muwatta. The first section is bab muwaqit al salah, the times of prayer, and he starts with the hadith about um, Jibril alayhi salam came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam and taught him the times of prayer, two days, the beginning time for each day, and then the next day was the end time. And he said, between these two times are the times of prayer. 
it's really, really a big part of our deem to know how that is, um, of how to do that. So Ahmed, at that point, he had been in prison about 17 years. He studies this and he says, oh, I want to do this. So he goes out to the, to the yard, the prison yard, and he gets a pole, he finds a pole, and he starts measuring the shadow, but he, doesn't, he can't see when Dhuhr comes in. So he went back in, and at that time we were sending in recordings on, on uh, CDs. And so he listened to the lecture five times. The next day, he went out. Now he's like, okay, I think I realized what I, what I, where, where I messed up. He went outside, he measured, he saw when the shadow moved and when it increased, and he saw when Dhuhr entered. I said, Ahmed, how did you feel when you actually saw Dhuhr enter using the shadow? He said, I've been Muslim for over 17 years. He said, it felt that the, 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 the joy that I felt was the same as the joy that I felt on the day I took my shahada. That's how, like, because now he, he sees it. He sees the creation of Allah. He sees how the Rasul, alayhi salatu wasalam, measured the, 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 the prayer and the time and, and learned all that. Then he did that for the rest of the prayers. Now he, like, he, he keeps a journal. Now he's keeping a journal on the prison yard with all the limitations. Imagine, there's not even vegetation in the prison yard. I've met people who have not touched a tree for 20 years. The first time they touch a tree is the first day out of prison. Um, there's no trees. There's a lot of places there's no grass. Um, with that said, so he's, he's, he's taking you know, note of all the prayer times. Then he starts noticing things on, on the yard, whatever, on the prison yard, whatever, whatever is growing, he starts drawing it. Then he wants to know about that, the, the, the flora that's there, those weeds, that, that whatever's there, he wants to learn. He sees birds come in and, 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 and insects. And now in his journaling of the prayer times, he's taking note of the flora and the fauna that li that's coming into the prison. Then he starts studying astronomy. He starts studying physics. And I told him, I said, Ahmed, what you've done in that, like in that little, the microcosm of your world, you've recreated what the Muslims did. Because the first thing they wanted to do was figure out the times of prayer. But then they learn about the astronomy and they're like, okay, there's a lot going on out there. Let's start naming these things. And hey, we learned some astronomy from the Indians and from the Persians and from the Greeks. Let's bring that all and bring the Arab astronomy. Let's put that together. And now we have Islamic astronomy. And then we need all this math figured out for inheritance. That's algebra. And you, you, you see what happened in the Ummah. We're so proud of that. Well, that can also happen on a very individual basis. And that, that's what happened uh, to Ahmed. So I mentioned that just to say that we're, we're, we, we should be proud of, of being people of the Ummah of Iqra. And that is the, the, the prophetic uh, method of, uh, of education. And so the shortcomings in teaching and learning, as Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghadda says, are a social crime. Those who commit this crime will deserve a worldly punishment. There's some other proofs that he uses to, to show that. Um, <clears throat> there's, the next section is just an overview of the prophetic met uh, method of education, and I want to I wanna list it out. But before that, I want to mention another example about gentleness. So when I first started teaching Muslims in prison, there was a sheikh who, who heard about that. He asked somebody else, he said, oh, how's Rami doing? I had met him a number of years, 20 years ago now, over 20 years, subhanAllah. And he said, how's Rami doing? He said, oh, he's good. He's now, you know, teaching people in the prison. He said, tell Rami to be gentle with the prisoners. Tell Rami to be gentle with the prisoners. And at the time when I heard it, and I'm going to admit, you know, I had a little bit of bad adab. I was like, ah, sheikh really doesn't know the dynamics of prisons and the harshness and the reality in there. I was like, I think they can, they can take it. They can handle it. I'm not saying I was going to be harsh. I just didn't feel that I had to be extra gentle with people who come from uh, gang backgrounds and uh, murderers and their fighters. And even as Muslims, when they leave their jahiliya, they're on, if, there's, if, there's a, if there's an attack, they're like, fi sabilillah. we will go to war to protect ourselves and to protect the Muslims and protect the weak. Like I had heard all these stories. I'm like, yeah, these aren't wishy-washy type people. Later on, I learned that even with them, with the, back, with the uh, raised in violent uh, neighborhoods, gangs and, and crimes, and then themselves uh, perpetrating things, and then the harshness of prisons, even in those situations, gentleness is an, has an amazing effect on it, and they need it. And I mentioned this to a brother, um, Brother Mustafa, who passed away last Ramadan. Did anybody ever eat at the Falafel Corner in Union City? Did you meet Brother Mustafa? African-American brother with glasses. He passed away last Ramadan. Amazing character, mashallah. Always smiling, and he always had the Qur'an open. And last November, when he passed away of a heart attack, he, pray, he, he, he prayed Fajr with his roommate, 
stood up to go to the kitchen, had his mushaf open, and he collapsed from a heart attack, then he was in a coma for two weeks, and then he passed away. He's buried here at um, Five Pillars Cemetery, right next to Musa Sarari, rahimahullah. Anybody know Musa? Brother, another amazing, he was always standing here, right? Film and recording MCC in the very early days. Any, if you, like a lot of the early uh, Masajid MCA here in San Leandro, you would always say, brother, see Brother Musa Sarari. They're buried right next to each other. And I think there's a, there's a, there's a huge lesson in that. And, and Brother Musa and Brother Mustafa buried right next to each other at Five Pillars. Um, Junaid's dad, yeah. So if you know Junaid, anybody know Junaid? Their kids are friends with him, yeah. Junaid's father, he, he used to be at North Star, also Elm Tree after school program sometimes. Um, so Brother Mustafa, I told him this story. I said, you know, Mustafa, years ago, a sheikh told me this about being gentle. And I, I didn't know it at first, but then after interacting, and, I, I, and I, I realized, he said, oh, yeah, he said, I know it. He said, I'll give you an example. So Mustafa tells me when he was at San Quentin, when he was teaching a class, he called up a, a brother uh, to the board to write something on the board during a ta'aleem session, something, it was Arabic maybe, and he just asked him to write something on the board, and he said the brother uh, broke down in tears. And I asked Mustafa, I said, this brother, he wasn't, he wasn't a pushover by any means. He said, oh no, I said, Mustafa, if something popped off on the yard, this brother was down, right? He said, oh yeah, this is not like a wishy-washy brother. This brother would hold his ground in a prison riot, and if you've ever seen the mayhem and the melee that occurs on a, in a prison riot, it's it's like um, just you never want to be in one of those situations. And I said he would never back down from that. I said, yeah. I said, but when you called him up to the board, he started crying, and he said, yeah. And he said, and I and I found out why. He said because when he was a child, second and third grader, and would be he would be called to the board. And he had a learning difference or a learning disability, whatever you want to refer it to. He had trouble with his education and he would be ridiculed by the teacher and the other students. And so that was when he was called to the board, even, I mean, he's with his, his friendly teacher Mustafa and with his fellow Muslims and they're learning the deen. And he started crying at the board because it triggered for him that trauma that he experienced as a child when people were not gentle with him, they were the extreme opposite and being harsh and scornful and, 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 and ridiculing him and that, that, that triggered it for him. So I, this, he told me that story in response to the sheikh's advice that remind him to be gentle with the prisoners. Um, so gentleness is, is a great go-to. I know there's some situations, as you were mentioning, sisters, sometimes with children, it doesn't always work. So we have to figure out how can we generally be gentle, like that may be our main, and then when we need to be stern, how can we be stern with care and gentleness? An overview of the prophetic model of education. Um, again, we apologize for not having the books in your hand. Uh, we'll get that once they're delivered here. They'll be at Munir's office. Sorry, I'm going to volunteer your office. But if you've registered, you can just go and pick one of those up. So an overview of the prophetic me me method of education. I presented this to a group of teachers and um, and, and one of the teachers said, just this page, we should print it off and put it in every classroom, like as a reminder or in your, in your home. So an overview of the prophetic model of education. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the foremost teacher of goodness, spoke eloquently, was clear in his expressions, sweet in his methodology, using subtle references, had a glowing spirit, open-hearted, soft-hearted, abundant compassion, used wisdom, had great foresight, high intelligence, extreme concern, and abundant kindness. That's a challenge to implement for us, isn't it? That would be very challenging. But if when we look at that, then we can ask ourselves, all right, how far or close am I to this? In individual interactions with my children, with my peers, you know, with my fellows on the, on the uh, like how is, that's generally, like sometimes people present the dean and they're like harsh and, banging on the table and like yelling at people and ridiculing them. It's like, well, like that's, that's not how he presented it, right? He wasn't, he had, he had, he had dignity about himself. Um, speaking about, we'll just go over the, um, uh, the, the, the speech of, of, of how he spoke. <clears throat> so we'll, we'll focus on that. Part of this is also found in the Shema'il. If you don't have a copy of Shema al tirmidhi and there's a new recent translation, please purchase it tonight. Like, have that book in your house. Again, it's a book that you can read on your own. You'll gain a lot of those gems and jewels 
even just through self-study of it. Uh, one of the, the sections in the Shema' of Imam al-Tirmidhi is, is his speech. How did he speak? So when we, when we look at how, what he said, we should also look at how he said it. So if we're conveying um, one of his hadith, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then let's not, let, let's not do it in a way that he wouldn't say. Let's not mumble. Let's not yell. Uh, he also, he never spoke very, like a very high, uh, uh, he never like yelled his message. He never spoke in a way to where people could not hear him. We all know that feeling like you're talking to somebody and you're like, you didn't catch things and how annoying it is as the listener. Like, wait a minute, what did you say? Or the quintessential hallmark of every masjid in Islamic organization that the, um, the problems with the audio, right? When it goes out or in the sister side, if you can't see the imam and you lose the audio, right? How frustrating that is. So his, and I'm not saying that about MCC. I don't even know if it, if it happens, uh, but it happens in almost every masjid, right? Like issues with the audio. So he, his speech, he would not speak very loud and he would not speak very low. He would speak very clearly. Um, he would speak clearly, use pauses to the point that listeners could do what with his words? They could count his words. Like sometimes we're, we're, we're just talking really fast and like, okay, just hold on, just let's take it. And I'm speaking to myself. My mother pointed that out to me. She said, Rami, one of the things you need to work on is um, speak slower and smile more. So I hope I'm doing it, mom. I've been working on it for a long time and I still have a lot of work to do. So he would speak clearly, use pauses, uh, repeat his words for emphasis. <clears throat> oh, here's another one. Would turn and fully face the person he was speaking with, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When you do that, even on a day-to-day -day interaction, like that's just a, that's an easy thing. Don't talk over your shoulder. Don't talk and you can't even face the person. Just try, if we can try that, just say, okay, you know what? Let me just, every time I'm going to speak with somebody, my child, my spouse, my friend, my boss, my coworker, my employee, my employer, somebody in the, in the store, let me turn and fully face them and just notice the difference that that has and just be present with that person and, and speak to them. I'll give you another example about this, turning and, and fully facing. One of the things that they mention, like from modern <clears throat> research and advice, I haven't seen this yet in the sunnah, but if you go to speak to a child, how should you speak with them? Get down on one knee. And I used to not do that. And when you do that, oh, it changed, it totally changes the, the interaction. And one brother, he pointed out to me, he's like, yeah, could you imagine? He's like, if the child is this tall and you're like this tall, it's like, it's like Dawood speaking to Jalut, right? It's like speaking to a giant. There's a lot of Heba just in that. So when you come down to their level, it's like, okay, yeah, we're, we're on the same level. Just get down on one knee and, you know, say salams to them. The other thing is, how have you, have you, again, that's something that I find from like modern advice, but I find it in line with the Sunnah. It seems like it would be in line, you know, with the Sunnah, but it's not necessarily that we, we can't say like doing that as a Sunnah. So I'm not trying, again, to extract. I'm just saying like, by principle-wise, it, it makes sense that it, it, it um, is congruent with the sunnah. The other thing is, and he would do this, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is that he would give attention to everybody in the group, even if it's a child. Now think jahili Arab society where you had to earn your place in the majlis. You had to earn the respect of the adults. And all of a sudden now, he's coming with his fledgling ummah, and they're saying, well, who, who is your people? Who are your tribe? This is Abu Bakr. Okay, we know Abu Bakr. He's a man. This is Quraysh. Men run the society. We got Abu Bakr. Who else do you got? Khadija. It's a woman. Who else is from Ali? A child? That's who? He, but they didn't know who Ali was. And a few years later, then he's going to be out on the battle as Haydar, slicing people in half. And saying, oh yeah, you, you mock that child and his potential and his ability, but look at what the Rasul alayhi salatu did. He, 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 he brought out the potential of all these people. Bilal, that's who your people is? Sumayya, that's who your people are? But they didn't see what he could see, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in that. Going back to the children, you, you'll notice this in Masajid. If there's, or even in, in people's homes, a group of people meet, there might be one or two children in the crowd, they shake hands with everybody and they skip over the kid. Right? Have they skipped over you? Yeah? But you've seen that, right? Why? If we know that the, the Rasul والسلام, would ask about every member of the, of the household and he would give attention to every single person, that makes a huge difference. When you give that individual attention uh, to people, to your children, to your students, to your fellows, it, it, it goes a long way. So he would turn and fully face the person um, and, 
He would also speak to the people in the dialect that they could understood, that they understood. To the point that sometimes, like one time, <clears throat> a man came into his presence, the Prophet ﷺ spoke it to him in Arabic, but in a dialect that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq didn't know, and the whole conversation happened and he left, and Abu Bakr didn't know what, what it was being said. So it speaks to his knowledge of, of, of the people's dialects, but also he respected them. He's like, I'm not going to speak to you in the, the dialect of Quraysh, I'm going to speak to you in, in your dialect. And <clears throat> one of the, um, the differences in um, <clears throat> these dialects is reflected in the Qira'at. So you might have heard like when I recited. Has anybody ever, is that the first time they ever heard Surah Al-Duha read that way? Yeah, so it's like, oh, that's different. Well, that's reflective of, of the different dialects of people. You can find a little bit of that in, in the Qira'at. Um, so the Imala or sometimes uh, the Sa'd is changed to za in certain Qira'at. So those different Qira'at reflect <clears throat> the different um, Qira'as of the, or the dialects of the people. <clears throat> so he would speak to them in a way they understood. How we can relate that, if you're speaking to children, you know, speak to them in a way that they understand. Don't, you don't have to speak in a, in a high-level academies uh, language. Um, you don't have to speak very fast. Um, you, can, you can bring it down. Uh, don't use complex and technical language. Oh, thank you, Mabir. I appreciate that. That's all cool. Here's another one. <clears throat> The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa abstained from argumentation. He abstained from argumentation. That is his sunnah. And, they, and it's so, so important. They said, min as sunnati and la tujadil an as sunnati. From the sunnah is that you don't argue about the sunnah. From the sunnah is not to argue about the sunnah. And there's a lot of hadith that talk about um, uh, leaving it, leaving disp uh, uh, disputation, mira, jidad, and so forth. There's a place for it. There's a place for back and forth. Um, but in general, the general rule should be stay away from argumentation. Because what happens? Most of the time when people get into arguments, does one side get, do you, do you convince the other side? No. Through modern research, and they did this on two like political groups, they took Republicans and Democrats, like hardliners. And they, they came up with, um, with a debate, like, like arguments, for each side. And they just, you know, they separate them one-on-one. -on -one, and so they, they're going to debate with each person individually. And, but they're going in hard on that, on, on that person. So with the Republicans, they're going in with the Democratic points. With the Democrats, they're going in with the Republican points. What they found is that after that, 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 uh, that um, what is it, like that, the, the, the introduction of that, of that segment of, and they use the same exact argument points with each, with each group. They found that each side was actually more entrenched in their views, more entrenched in their views. So it's just part of human nature. Like you want to defend your, your, your point. And if you argued about it, you're actually going to, you know, you're going to dig in, dig your heels in even more. And there was one person who was talking about this. Yeah. Okay. There was one person who was talking about this and he said that, that sometimes when we try to approach people from like a cognitive level, like, okay, I want to change your heart by just going brain to brain, brain to brain, you know, like, like this. He said, that's not the way. You have to go in through other ways, like showing care, compassion for the person, uh, honoring them. And so then I thought to myself, wow, the Prophet ﷺ, when he came to Medina, he said, feed people. What would happen instead of a debate, say, you know, look, let's just go have a meal, right? Let's just go have a meal, have, you know, and then the person eats the food and gets honored, it completely changes the, 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 the scenario. There was one man after Katrina from a small town in Mississippi. He went down to New Orleans area <clears throat> and got some of the relief that Islamic Relief was giving. And I'm not paid by Islamic Relief, but for all those listening, support Islamic Relief. They do amazing work. They're one of the only people, the first people that were allowed in in Katrina, even before <clears throat> other organizations. <clears throat> And what is their logo? It looks like a masjid, right? So after he gets some support from Islamic Relief, he takes the bumper sticker, puts it on the back of his truck, goes on these little roads. You can imagine little, my mom's from Mississippi. I grew up a portion of my life in Mississippi. So I know those backwood gravel roads in Mississippi, like it's deep in the country. And he goes and he goes and his neighbor comes and he sees the Islamic Relief and it's got the masjid. He said, take that off your car. And he said, no. He said, I'll give you $20 to take it off the car. He said, no. He said, I'll give you $100 to take it off the car. He said, no. He said, these people fed me. 
when I was in need. These people helped me. So now imagine the difference between if like we went to that same person, and we're like, all right, let's have a debate about Islam. As opposed to like, hey, hey, we could talk about this later. We don't even have to talk about it. Do you need any help? Some rent assistance? You know, you got some debt, you know, debt relief. We have this thing called zakat. It's not the cat, it's zakat, you know, but we, we have debt relief in there. We can help you get out of debt. Imagine if, if Muslims like started funneling some, some of our zakat to debt relief in amongst non-Muslims in America, like on a systematic fashion. Like you can walk into a store just like, uh, sorry, uh, um, uh, an office, just like Catholic charities. And we have Muslim charities. And it's just like, yep, we're not going to hand you any pamphlets. We're not going to hand you a Quran. You know, if you want to get them, you can. Uh, the impact will, 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 will happen nonetheless. But it, we, we don't always have to go in through argumentation. And the same thing can happen with our students, with our friends. You know, we don't have to always think cognitively. We can go in through this ihsan, this door of ihsan. I saw you were going to ask a question. Uh, regarding um, uh, education, uh, one of the states where, yeah. Yeah, so the question was about, you know, uh, dialectical and, de and debate teams and so forth. <clears throat> I definitely think there is, there, there's a, there's a, there is a place for that. And there's actually sections in the books of, of, of the Sunnah about how to have a Sunnah compliant debate. So in general, we want to avoid it, but there is a way to, to have it. And one of the things that I, I will say about like debate clubs is they have certain parameters set up to where it doesn't cause, or it, at least it, it will, it will reduce the chance of causing enmity between those people like there's there's etiquettes and there's you know they, they meet up before they meet up i don't know all the details on but i know it's just like in a in a team sports team competition right there's like this the, the camaraderie and the ethics and the the chivalry of the sports like look you're gonna shake hands i don't know if they still do that i know that when, when i growing up after every soccer game or you know you shake hands with the opposing team right so things like that it's like it's not personal we're not going in so if there's things set up uh to be able to prevent that then, then there is there is um, something to be said about that. To be able to learn how to um, to refute things and to refute in a manner where you can actually um, you don't have to. It doesn't have to be a ping pong match where it's like you know tit for tat. Like here, you said this. What about teaching people methods? And there's whole books on jidal, like how how to have a sunnah compliant debate. Um, and when I read them, there's actually if you're interested, I got some training in this. It's called the practice of dialogue. So not just dialogue, let's have a dialogue. It's called the practice of dialogue, and they use what's called the Cantor system, uh, where this person looked at how people interact with each other, and there's four voices that people generally use, and depending on the voice that you use, if you use the opposition voice, so I'll just you get that. There's four voices. Basically, there's move, follow, oppose, and bystand. Though in any family system, in any classroom, in anything, you will find because they just they they analyze how people interact with each other, and they found everybody in any interaction they either make a move, they make an oppose. A move meaning like I think this is or I think this is not right. Making a statement like this is this is the way it should be or this is the way it is. I'm making a move saying this is or this is not or this should be. Oppose would be I'm going to oppose that. Bystand was like, I'm not making a move or, or an oppose. I'm just pointing out what's going on here. There's some other data. There's some other things. And then there's the, there's the follow voice. Yeah, I think that's, that's correct. So any family, any work, any classroom, you're going to find these, these voices. And if you know how to use them properly, and the key one is the, is the oppose. So they call it the respectful oppose and the, the disrespectful oppose, or the successful oppose and the unsuccessful oppose. The respectful oppose, it has three components. You summarize to the person what you heard them say. Summarize what you heard them say. Explain why you disagree with that. And then you, 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 you present your, your, your position. Now think about the, mo the majority of opposes that people do. I, I hear what you're saying, but... Does the person actually like, do you really... And then usually what happens like, no, 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 you, you, don't, you, you don't understand what I said. So now to be able to summarize to that person what, what they said, you actually have to listen. And that's a skill that most people don't have. Just like, and it's not listen like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, it's like they got their hands on the trigger, you know, the triggers are, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. And it's like, he takes a breath. But what I was going to say, that's how most people are, right? 
So you actually have to retrain yourself to be like, let me listen, let me, we've been talking about the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in the Rawda. My first trip to, to, the, to the masjid, when we, when we do dua, um, or when I do dua, I face the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa I'm not making dua to him, but Imam Malik was asked by Harun al-Rashid, he says, when I go to the masjid, should I face the Qibla? Uh, okay, we're using this, but should I face the Qibla or should I face him? Because if you're at the Muwajaha visiting him and you face the Qibla, what are you doing? You're turning your back to him. So he's like, now I want to make dua to Allah. And we also know from another hadith, where, what is the Qibla of dua anyway? Like a lot of people like generally, oh, let me face the Qibla of Salah. But what is the Qibla of dua? Most people don't even know this from the Sunnah. As sama. The Qibla of dua is sama. That's the Qibla of the dua. So, but in this situation, Harun al-Rashid was like, what do I do? If I'm at the Muwajaha, do I face the Qibla and have that etiquette, bring that etiquette of the prayer into my, my dua or, and have my back to the Prophet or do I face him? And Imam Malik said, how would you face away from him? And he is your way into Jannah and your father Adam's way into Jannah. Like all of humanity has to go through him. Why would you turn your face away from him? He said, you face him. Now, it's, it's not that you're doing dua to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's just like, like if we were going to do a group dua, would you find it to be bad etiquette if somebody's like, like as we're doing a group dua, somebody just turns away from, from, from us? Would it? And that's just in our human interaction like here. So why would we turn away from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So I go in gung-ho like with that in mind. And I'm doing my dua and one of the haram police come up and he's like, turn away and face... So I start trying to have this, I'm like trying to tell him the story of Imam Malik and so forth. And you know, he's like, how the kidib, you know, this is wrong, you know. After I left, I, I felt very remorseful. Because I did that in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we're known, La tarfa'u aswatukum fawqa sawtid nabi. Do not raise your voice in, the, uh, uh, in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I made tawbah from that. The next time I went to Medina, I was in the Rauda and this man saw me with my hands down as the, uh, the Maliki school is, and I only made one salam from my prayer. He came to me to argue that it was wrong. I listened to him for half an hour. And, and I only mentioned one hadith, a hadith that Ibn Majah and others relate that Aisha radiallahu anha said she saw the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam only do one salam. And so that's what the Maliki school is, one salam to, to end the prayer. Um, that's all I mentioned. I just mentioned that hadith. Other than that, I was just listening to everything he had to say. And then at the end, he said, he said, Adabtani. You have, you have given me adab. Alamtani husn al istima. You have taught me how to really listen to people. I didn't have the heart to say, well, it's not you. Rasul is right there, and I don't want to do what I did with the other guy. Uh, but what that taught me is, and then af every time afterwards, after I saw him in Medina, we were like close friends, even though we would continue the debate. But it, it, it engendered something between us when I actually showed like, I'm listening to you because what does that other, other, the message to the other person? You care about me. You care about what I say. So in a, in a debate or a dialogue, if you actually listen to the person and, and, and ask questions, open-ended questions, like what? It's like, well, what about this? And, what, like, and they're like, oh, wow, this person is actually interested in my, in my, in my uh, uh, opinion. Your child, if you do this with your child, with a student, and they're like, no, I don't think that is. Oh, that's interesting. So what makes you think that? And don't use the word why. Why do you do this? Why do you think this? That's, that's a big one. Again, it's not from the sunnah, but it's just our modern, like looking at how language is used. And then if we're trying to engender compassion between us in our interaction, then it makes sense. So if somebody's talking to you and they say, well, why do you do this? Uh, wh why, do you, why do you wear that thing on your head? If somebody came up to you and asked you as a sister, like, why do you wear that thing on your head? And why do you put your hand, why do you put your foot in the sink? If they say, or let me not even like put that, like, why do you wear that thing on your head? Why, do you, why, do you, why don't you shave? Why, why do you put your foot in the sink? When a person says why, what does that conjure up for you? Hmm? Defense, right? Puts you on the defense because most people's questions are actually, they said that 40% of questions are actually statements disguised as questions. Another 40, and this is by analyzing how human beings talk. Another 40% are judgments disguised as questions. And only 20% are actually questions of genuine inquiry. Like, I really want to know what you're saying. And so when you say why, it just triggers for the person like, you know, you know it triggers that statement, uh, the 80% that we're used to. Why, why do you do that? Why do you got that thing on your head? As opposed to, 
So what are some of the benefits that you find from wearing that thing on your head? Or what, what is one of the reasons that I see you putting your foot in the sink? You know, like once you change it to what, it just happens in our, our language that it makes the person think like, oh, this person actually wants to know what I'm thinking. of. What time do they, the salah here? Oh, 10 o'clock? Okay. <clears throat> Uh, one of the points I have in here is I speak into the mic, and if we need to turn away, don't speak until we're by, back fe fi facing the microphone. Like that could be a, a way we implement the sunnah of being clear with our voice is, you know, because if I go back to this and I start talking, you can't hear me as much, right? So just to, um, to, to, speak, uh, to speak clearly, not to use academies in our lectures um, for the general population, using a vocabulary that the <clears throat> general student will understand. One of the things that we mentioned here is that the average reading level of U.S. prisoners is below fifth grade level. So that means for us at Taiba, we can't just take any Islamic book and expect them to understand it. Some will. Some are, you know, you could put them up against Harvard, Harvard debate teams and they'll like dunk on them all day long because they're spending hundreds of hours in the law libraries. They're spending hundreds of hours learning Arabic and tafsir and this. Like they are scholars at, in every meaning of, uh, of the word. But for the average person, we have to present the material in a way that they can understand. <clears throat> so this is one of the reasons why we develop our own material, to take what's, what's available and then to um, make it in the, in the language of the students or accessible to them. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa would not confuse people with esoteric speech and would give each person what they needed. And there's one of the stories they mentioned, Mulana Ashraf Ali Tanwi says that, um, um, oh, he said there was a scholar from D uh, Delhi that taught the Sulam, which is a book on logic. And the students requested a detailed lecture based on the commentaries. And then he provided that. And then he asked them during the following lesson to repeat what they heard and they were not able to. And so he said, what is the sense in me taxing my brain when you can't remember anything? Now tell me how should I teach? Uh, all of them uh, replied, teaching the actual text of the book is sufficient. So sometimes we can go into, especially with, 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 um, with, with children and young people when we're, when we're explaining things, try to, and this is a difficult thing, try to make it like in bite-sized morsels to, way they, to where they can understand it. Also try avoiding matters that even if it's from the sunnah, that it could just cause a person to go in a tailspin and like, Think about that when there should be more important things to, to, to focus on. Sure. Uh, in the East Coast, they love to be direct and people enjoy it and they admire it. On the yeah. West Coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, great, great question. Yeah, that's a great question, and not something that I uh, have an answer to or can solve. The question was about like East Coast, West Coast. There was a funny video about how people <laughs> in the East Coast will ask you about if you need a tire changed, and like you know they might yell at you on the East Coast, but they'll get out there and actually like fix your tire but then yell at you like what were you doing when you like you know why did you avoid that thing whereas in california it's like oh man you got a flat tire yeah good luck dude um but there is there is a difference in how people talk um based in in, in the cultures even in mauritania sometimes when i would be in the, the marketplace and interact with people and i was very direct and they're like oh you must be from eastern mauritania because the eastern mauritanians are known to be more direct than the western mauritanians similar to here in the u.s right so i don't know what it is about just the coast just kind of like mellows you out um but yeah that is some there is something to be said that that certain people will not will get a message um clearer from other like if you know the nuances of the culture so yeah i would say if somebody is really going to um uh be able to deliver that not only do you have to like balance in terms of like the gentleness and the directness but also know your audience in general um and and every situation is going to be different and at the at the end of the day that's what i was mentioning earlier about the ijtihad of the moment like that that decision that you will make in the moment like what am i going to say and how am i going to say it in that moment 
You just do your due diligence in like absorbing as much as you can of the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then you ask Allah for tawfiq in doing that and then it's coming through you as a prism in that moment and you just say, you know, tawfiq, ya Allah, let me say this. And sometimes you might have to yell at it. Okay, um, oh, yes. Yeah, it, it is overwhelming. So you, you have the general population, then you have people that you know. So in this uh, course, we're talking about the prophetic model of teaching. And generally, that's the teacher-student interaction or parent-child or maybe amongst your siblings, like the people that you know. And so there is one method of, of interacting with people that it's with the, um, the, like, the default, like just the people you don't know. How are you going to interact with them? And there's no one way, like I'm going to, I can't say like what to say to the people in that moment and what would be um, congruent with the sunnah at that moment. Allahu alam. I don't know in those things. But generally the people, we're, we're talking more about like the people that you know and that you can build up knowledge of that person. I'll, I'll give a, a concrete example. You know how there's people in every single masjid that take it upon themselves to be the haram police? There's always that brother or that sister there's always that auntie or that uncle, right? Like my father, Allah, may Allah have mercy on him, he saw a person at one of the messages here in the Bay Area, I won't mention it. There was a person who took their shahada, and on the day they took their shahada, like he's trying to pray. And you know how people have trouble sitting down in the prayer and, and sitting on their, on their feet in the sunnah style? So this person goes up to him in his prayer, the new Muslim, and starts twisting his feet. Um... There's another situation, and this happened in another masjid here in the Bay Area. A sister, she, she became Muslim. She's a teenager, older teenager. She doesn't tell her family because they are, um, if they found out she was Muslim, they would kick her out of the house. And what would happen to any person, young male or female in this, in this society, if they were kicked out of their house, right? It's very dangerous. So she was hiding her Islam. She still goes to the masjid. She wears hijab, but she takes it off when she goes home. But she's walking home with hijab. Brother pulls up in the, in the car as she's leaving the masjid, rolls down the window, which is already bad, right? That's like, that's not the, and, say, and, then, and then says, Salam alaikum sister, and makes some comments about her clothing and then drives off. So again, going back to like, um, and I don't know what she was wearing or what he said, but the, the whole interaction is like, that's not, so my, my advice to Masajid, and in general, that, that the reminders, the nasihas, the hisbah, the amr bil ma'roof, nahi anil munkar, the, incur, the enjoining righteousness and forbidding evil, should be delegated to people in the masjid who know the people. Because you all know people, Muslim, or let's just say Muslim, Muslims that you know, that if they walked in the masjid and they got a, a, harsh masjid, a harsh message, that might be the last time they walk in through those doors. But you, because you know them and you're, you're your friend, you could deliver the same exact message, but you know how to do it and uh, you know how to use the, uh, you know, the, the right words at the right time. Um, parents, for example. Who's, who's a parent that has had somebody who's not you know, a parent come up to you and tell you how you should be raising your kids? right? Or they see you interact with one of your kids and then afterwards like, why were you so stern with them? Or why were you so gentle with them? Right? But you as an expert, you know, like, look, this, this son of mine or this daughter of mine, if I was stern with him or her in that moment, like that's not going to work. So you as an outsider, not knowing this human being and all their subtleties and all their, you know, like you're not an expert on this child. I am. So I know how to deliver the message that they need. I'm the expert on this child. In the same way, people in the community, who should be delivering those messages? It's not a person just like anybody like, oh, I see somebody and I self-appointed, you know, Hispa police, I'm going to go over there and tell the person. You really have to know the person. I'll give you another geopolitical. In, in the ISIS-controlled territories, you know who, who they would appoint as the police? The non-natives of those cities. So if they were in Syria in a city, it would be Algerians and Libyans. They're given the police. What's going to happen in that structure? What's going to happen when you have policemen who are like given this power and they don't know the, those people? As opposed, say they took their own ISIS people from that area and made them the police. What would be the difference in the dynamics? As opposed to have foreign nationals as the police force, as opposed to local population as a police force. You can all, you can see what's going to happen, right? Because the local person be like, no, no, hold on, hold on one second. This Abu Ahmed, I know him. I know his cousin. I was at his you know, niece's wedding. Now, hold on one second. Like, okay, we're going to follow the law, but just hold on one second. I know Abu Ahmed, and let's, let's, let's work with him, right? As opposed to somebody who's like, nope, this is the truth, and let's go 
uh, headstrong with that. So I'm just giving a couple of examples uh, to, 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 to say that it's really important to know the person that we're dealing with. At the same time, there's certain times where we're going to have to interact with people and we don't know what they, um, where they're coming from. You go up to somebody like at a, a customer service thing at the airport, right? You just have like five minutes to interact with this person. How are you going to interact? And we all know you can be gentle, but then if you if they if you're come across as a pushover, then you need to have a little bit of like izza, like pride, like okay, hold on a second, I'm going to be stern with 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 respect. Um, I know this is going to end in about half an hour. Um, the messenger of Allah would not cut people off in the middle of their speech unless they transgress the bounds or digress from the truth. He exercised patience over strangers' ill-mannered way of speaking and asking, such as, such as the harshness of the Bedouin Arabs. We all know those stories, right? So how can we bring those into our, our lives? And also, like you were saying, you know, knowing when, when are we going to show that forbearance, that hilm, and, and give precedence to that manner of the sunnah and when are we going to be like no we're gonna we're gonna stand up I'm, I'm not going to have that because we can have both it's not either or oh this is another beautiful one they're all beautiful the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam would give each of those sitting with him his attention none of those sitting with him ever thought that the other was being given more attention like each sahaba thought he was the best friend of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I've had this experience with one of my teachers, Sheikh uh, uh, Muhammad Al-Amin, popularly known as, as Hadda Amin, just like a, as a nickname. And wallahi, I thought I was his favorite student. And I kept it to myself because when talking to the other students, I didn't want to be like, you know, I'm, I'm the teacher's favorite student. And then one day, my good friend, Nabil, who was also, we were also studying at the same time, lived in the same tent. We were talking about something, and he says, you know, I think I'm his favorite student. I was like, oh, hold on a second. No, I'm his favorite student. And I started listing out the, and then we started talking with other people, and wallahi, everybody thought he was that sheikh's favorite student. So what does that tell you about like that, that personal one-on-one -on -one interaction that he's giving to, to, to each person? How can we do that? How can we do that in our classrooms how can we do that in our homes in our communities to make each person feel like they are they are uh respected and that they they're they're felt to be the favorite without showing favoritism to others that's a challenge i don't know how to do it i don't know the 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 answer oh this is this is another one oh th actually this is the page that, that where it says maybe print and laminate for the teacher it's actually more of them so the Prophet ﷺ, uh, would teach through asking questions. He would answer questions. He would answer with more than what was asked. He would give examples. He would swear by Allah when speaking. Not all the time. You know, like Islamic school students, they're like, Wallahi, bro, Wallahi, Wallahi, Wallahi. Like all the time. Not all the time, but not leaving it totally. Swearing by Allah when appropriate. Um, sometimes divert the questioner from, from, uh, from the question for a wisdom. This is a deep one. Because sometimes when people are asking questions, that's not really what they're asking about. So again, going back to that nuanced understanding of this person, like, uh, actually, I think what you're what you're looking for is over here. So we can we can let's change the conversation over here. Using writing, using drawing, and I'm going to give an example of the drawing. Giving a simile, explicitly saying something, alluding to something, or insinuating. Present a doubt, then give an answer. Joking, debate. Introduce a subject subtly, comparing between two things. Refer to the underlying reasons to provide an answer. Ask questions when he or she would know the answer in order to test the people. Giving partial information so that they would ask. Giving specific time to the women. Take into consideration that there were children present. Now all of those, like when you read Sheikh Abdul Fatah Abu Ghudda's uh, book of the hadith and the stories, you're going to see all those. What this is, is basically like, all right, here are the themes that you would see in, in all of his interactions. Now, how do we implement those? Um, to give you an example of the drawing, I put it on the cover of this book. Can everybody see that? Again, if you had the books in your hand, you would be able to just look at it. I apologize for that. But it's basically, the Sahaba said, the Prophet ﷺ drew a square for us in the sand. Now, we don't know exactly what it looked like. We have the description of what he did. In some of the Hadith books, you will actually, the Hadith transmitters would draw something out. So this is my interpretation of what that Hadith is, is saying. 
Uh, and if you look it up online, if you look profit, Drew brought box, sand, if you look, you'll see all these different interpretations of what it actually looked like. This is just mine based on what my reading of the hadith. Um, so he drew a box in the sand. He drew a line starting in the box, emanating out of the box, and then drew lines from, from that in, in, initial line in the box. It's like PowerPoint presentation, right? And he said, the, this box, what it symbolizes is your life, your lifespan. The, the, the beginning, there's a beginning to it. There's an end. This line is your hope. Look, it's going outside of the box because every single one of us, and may Allah give you all long and, 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 and flourished, flourishing lives, we all have hopes and dreams that we'll never attain. So our hopes and dreams are outside of the box. And then these are the distractions. These are the things that distract us away from the straight path and fulfilling, fulfilling our hopes. Um, what are those distractions? Now, he didn't say exactly what those distractions are. He just said, these are the distractions. Now, he, he gave us, this is almost like, I, I've told people, if you want to do like a daily journaling, you could do this as a, as a daily journal. Just draw out this box. What are my hopes for to get from the end of the day? What are the possible distractions? And then I got to be realistic. I'm never going to reach all of them. So let me plan accordingly. And then understand what are the things that are going to distract me from my daily goals. This could be a weekly thing. This could be a life calendar. This could be, you know, just in general. It's a powerful symbol that he gave us. Now what we can do as teachers, we can say like, all right, let me draw a picture. I love always having like a whiteboard. And I, uh, if, if I had that, I would probably be on the whiteboard uh, most of the time. I love drawing uh, and trying to explain it. Sometimes to a fault, people are like, don't always have to draw a picture, Rami. Um, all right. One of the things that I said, like in terms of to encapsulate the, the distractions, and again, that's not from the hadith, this is just a separate thing, is Sheikh Ahmed Bamba. Has anybody heard of Sheikh Ahmed Bamba? If you have not, please go home and read some articles or some books. He's from the late 1800s, early 1900s in the Senegambia area. He established a city called Tuba. And before Gandhi and Martin Luther King's nonviolent res resistance and a successful nonviolent resistance, you know who it was? Sheikh Ahmed Bamba. Because he looked at the European, especially the French colonization of all of Western North Africa, and literally the massacring of entire villages, entire schools, taking out entire, I mean, how many generations in one school would he, they, they bring out if they just massacred everybody, and they would just mow them down with their machine guns. So they have massive amount of troops, they have steam engines, they have machine guns, and they're going up with people still fighting with spears, bows and arrows, and swords. Because that's what a lot of them, that, that's the only weapon, weaponry they had. And so there were, there were military jihad resistance against the French. Sheikh Ahmed Bamba said, that's not working. So we're going to have not only a nonviolent resistance, because we're not going to give the French any reason to, to, to kill us. Nonviolent resistance and a cultural, religious, and linguistic resistance. So he said, everybody be proud of your language, Wolof. You're going to speak that before you speak French. Be proud of your local grains. You don't need their rice that they're importing. Grow your millet. We're all going to grow our own grains. He said, um, um, we don't even need their coffee. We'll grow their, our own coffee. He established a city under a tree and called it Tuba. The city has over a million people now. They produce their own electricity. They have a thriving economy. Sometimes they've even loaned money to the Senegalese government. It's semi-autonomous in, in some ways. They'll give you land to build there if you go there, but you can't own it. It belongs like as a waqf to this area. And you could see, wow, like all of these other uh, resistance movements, they either kind of withered away, but what like withstood the test of time was Sheikh Ahmed Obama's uh, methodology. One of the things he told all of his people, he said, Allah tells us in the Quran to pray. And right after prayer, what's the order with the prayer? Zakah. Aqimu salat wa atu zakah. So he said, every single one of our community is going to pray and we're all going to give zakat. The only way you can give zakat is if you... Made money. And the only way you're going to make money is if you strong worth, ec worth ec ethic. And he, 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 he put that into his community. So, Sheikh Ahmed Bamba said that the distractions of the dunya are summarized in the word neshhadu. When we say neshhadu and la ilaha illallah. Noon, sheen, ha, and dal. Those are the distractions of the dunya. Noon would be what? This is an acronym. Hmm? Nefs. Sheen. Shaitan. Ha, hawa, uh, blameworthy desires, and dal, the dunya. 
So that's it. That's the, that's the, everything else falls into one of those, those categories. When we talk about social media, when we talk about uh, wealth, when we talk about prestige, whatever, it falls into one of those categories. Okay, now I'm not going, again, I'm not going to be able to go, um, but I'll just read some of the, the, um, the, the section titles. Teaching with action, teaching in stages, preventing boredom in students. That's an important one, right? Like uh, <laughs> in one of these back rooms, I had to step out earlier to make a phone call. And in one of the rooms, some, one of the kids wrote, I hate Sunday school. <laughs> Have you seen that? And I actually felt like erasing and I was like, no, nah, let's leave it. Is that what you felt too? Just leave it. Just like, so the reality is like, are we going to prevent that and chill, like completely cut that off for kids? No. But can we mitigate that a little bit? Yeah, we can. There are ways. Uh, when, before COVID and this, our, our youth program here at MCC kind of got obliterated by COVID. Um, but one of the things that we did, we had the halakha for the boys here in these back rooms. And then just doing paper and exercises, like we couldn't, it wouldn't, it wasn't work. For, it didn't work for the boys. So we rented the the gym over here at what's the the junior high school's name? Hart Middle School. We rented out the gym as long as it wasn't in basketball season. And we would have pizza and basketball and sports. And then some of the, some of the the, the, the kids brought like the, they wanted to draw. They want, and so I was like, you don't want to go out there and do the sports? Like, no, I just want to draw. So we set up a table for them to draw. And so everybody had like some place to, 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 to be. We had, we had pizza, the sports, the basketball, and then we had halakha. And guess what happened in those halakhas? We had a lot more attention and a lot more retention of the material when we had the halakhas over there. So like you have to like figure out, all right, we don't have, we're not going to give up completely. Like we still need to do this halakha, boys. But let's do something where we can say like we can, we can do both. That's just an example of how we prevented boredom in, 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 in our students. Um, another one he says is, um, he narrates, this is both in Bukhari and Muslim, on the authority of Anas ibn Malik, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, make things easy for people and do not make things diff uh, difficult for them, right? Yassiru, wa la tu'assiru, like make it easy. And give glad tidings and do not alienate them. About this hadith, Imam Nawawi says, we learn the importance of giving glad tidings of grace and mercy, that we are prohibited from alienating people and frightening them. You know, sometimes, especially on the minbar, they, they call it the bully pulpit sometimes, like there could be this message of just like, you're doing things wrong, and you, and you, and you, and, the, and they make you feel like, oh man, I'm not doing anything wrong. Where is it in our classrooms, in our minbars, in our homes, where, where we're giving glad tidings of grace and mercy? And I'm going to give you a, a, a story that I learned. I learned this from one of my teachers, how he did this for me. Um, he says that we are prohibited from alienating people and frightening them, that we should bring new Muslims, new, newly practic practicing Muslims and the youth close to the faith and not be strict with them and teach them gradually. Um, Ibn Hajar says that knowledge of religion is like the practice of religion in that and you give it gradually and we invite a person to grow closer to faith. That we give it gradually. Now, how that happens, how we implement it, you know, that's the, that, that, that's the difficult part. When I was in Mauritania, um, there was a, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll just give, sometimes I try to remove the details, but so I knew somebody who had collected a lot of like the McDonald's Happy Meals toys. I don't eat at McDonald's, but the person's like, hey, give this to the children in the village. I'm like, sure, great idea. Toys for the village, right? And literally, my handbag on the, the, the plane trip back was just those toys. That's how many it was. It collected that many Happy Meal toys. I went to the village, went to one of the, it was one of the, the sheikh's children. He came by. I was like, here you go. Just came back, you know, go distribute these. Well, they have, they, they take a very um, conservative stance on those that being three-dimensional figures, but they don't want those type of toys in the village. And so a couple of days later, I heard, and they said, yeah, you know, Murabat um, Haddamin, Sheikh Haddamin, he heard, he saw one of those toys. And it was, it was funny because, you remember Rugrats? There was one kid with like a big head. <laughs> so my friend said he was with the Sheikh when one of the kids came with like the little Rugrat thing. And he, imagine, this is a person, I was there when he first saw raisins. Like that's how remote he is in the, so then he sees the little Rugrat character and to him it's like, you know, three dimensional image, we don't want those toys. Like, and so he told one of the, he said, go throw, throw it in one of the canyons. So he collected up all the toys and threw it, threw it into one of the canyons. 
So I get the, now I'm, I was so happy, you know, to bring these toys and I gave up all, everything that I could have carried in my carry on luggage. And I felt so bad that now I've insulted the Sheikh and the people of the village and they had to carry it up to one of the canyons and dump all the toys into the canyon. So I went to uh, Sheikh Haddamin and after my daughter, uh, you know, and it was very awkward for me because like I knew that this had just happened yesterday and I felt really bad and I, I asked him to come close and I, I apologized. I said, I'm sorry I brought these to the village. He said, no, no, Ram. He said, your intention was very good and you get reward for that intention. He said, it's just that we don't prefer, you know, prefer this type of toy in our village for any, he explained the reasons. And then he taught me another lesson that later I read it in one of the books, but I mean, I learned it in, in that interaction. He said, the ulama of Ahlul Sunnah discussed this, like if a person does an action that has an element of good and an element of bad in it, is it all bad? Is it like, does the bad void out the good? They discussed it as like a theological question. And the example they gave was that if a person steals a horse and steals weapons and goes out to defend Muslims in, in, in an impending, like, uh, like an invasion and dies, do we consider that person to be a shaheed and all of that honor of them being a shaheed? Or do we say, nah, the brother was a thief. He stole a horse and stole weapons. And so they said, no, we can't, we don't negate that good status they, got, they did from having like, uh, we can look at two separate things. Yeah, it was wrong for him to steal, but he's still a shaheed. And so that's what Sheikh Handemin told me in that situation. He was like, he's like, your intention was good. And that relieved me so much. And anybody who's, especially if you've de dealt with children, uh, Faisal, you were asking earlier about like, you know, um, dignity and with children, these points of like the glad tidings of grace and mercy I've found that it's more important with children than it is even with adults. Because for them, especially children, when they're younger, they're very concrete in their thinking. And it's hard for them to think abstractly. So when they hear the concepts of uh, Jannah and Jahannam, reward and punishment, like they really take it, like they think it's black and white, like it's wrong. I recently, I was at Mina, um, Muslim Youth of North America at the camp, and we were talking about something and, and um, a kid came up to me and he, he had a question Oh, the question that it was during the Q&A period, he had asked about if people get doubts about faith. And I mentioned, I said, this was mentioned to the Prophet ﷺ by some of the Sahaba, and he actually commended them. He said, oh, wow, you're getting these faith, these doubts? That's a good thing. Because the shaitan is only going to whisper to a person who has something very valuable. And if you have iman in your heart, and you're getting these whisperings, it's like a thief. If you have a thief trying to break into your house, it means you got something valuable in your house. So that thief trying to break in is actually a testament to the valuables in your house. So if the shaitan is giving you whisperings about faith, it's a testament that you have something very valuable in your heart. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ was teaching the Sahaba. But he did tell them, he said, just don't, he actually said, don't argue with the shaitan. Like that's, you're not gonna, you're not gonna win that debate and it's just gonna lead to more, more doubt. So debates, we can have it with humans, but not with the shaitan. So when he comes, you just say, A'udhu billahi min shaitan al-rajim, amantu billah, right? I, oh, you want to give me doubts? Amen to Billah. I'm going to do dhikr and I'm going to reaffirm my faith. So I mentioned that and this young man came up to me like he's probably maybe 12 or 13 and he started crying. And he said, thank you for mentioning that. I was the one who asked that question. And then he kept crying and I took him away from the crowd because you know, I might get embarrassed for, for the crying. And I just reaffirmed. He's like, but I just get these doubts, you know, like, you know, uh, I get that. I was like, it's okay. You know, you're, you're okay. You're good. You know, uh, uh, that, that's actually a good sign. So that's like an example of where, I mean, if you took a harsh stance and be like, oh, that's wrong, stuff it Allah, like as opposed to glad tidings of grace and mercy and how it will help a person develop. We only have 15 more minutes before the end. Um, even if we did this in four hours, we would not be able to get through the entire thing. Um, again, what I would say is that when, once you get this book in your hand, read through it. It's only about... We, is, again, it's an outline. It's really bullet point outline. It's not even a, a, a complete book. Has a lot of information about the work we do at Leiba and how we're bringing in these lessons into our work. So you can see some of the, the practical examples of how we're implementing this um, to give you some ideas of, of, of how you can then take the lessons and bring it into your life. Um, what I'll say is a couple of things. I want you to be encouraged to be able to read this on your own. If you have other people that you can discuss it, the, the strategies for application, that's something we can all uh, discuss about. Um, there was, there's a famous story where uh, when, the, when the Sahaba came to the, to the Battle of Badr to meet the Quraysh, the reason why it's called Badr is because there's the wells of Badr. It's a place that has, has wells there. 
And so the, if imagine if there's, there's three wells here, the, the Prophet وسلم, stopped before the wells. And one of the Sahaba said, is this from Wahi? Is this, you know, this decision to stop, to, to make camp here, is this from Wahi, revelation? Or is this from Ra'i? Or is this from your personal opinion? And it's very important why the Sahaba are asking this because they, they're, at, they're in a mindset that if, if you tell us from, from your wahi, from revelation, ride our horses into the ocean, what are the Sahaba going to do? They're going to ride all the way into the ocean. They're like, Sami'na wa ata'na. We have heard and we have obeyed. They also knew that he was a man, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and certain things were his, his opinion until he got revelation about it. So that's why he's asking. He said, this is from my uh, ra'i. He said, if this, is, if this is a personal decision, in other words, and we can have a council about it and we can share our opinion, he didn't say all of that. I'm adding th those words in. We should make our camp after the wells. Why? Supplies from who? But why are we why are we uh, defending a position after the wells? So the enemy Quraysh doesn't have access, and the Battle of Badr now it, it happened on the seventeenth day of Ramadan in the summertime. You know how Ramadan changes, right? So in July, in the summertime, in the Hijaz, you know how hot it is there. It's hot in like December, so imagine how hot it is in 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 the middle of the summer. Quraysh show up. They don't have access to the water. The fact that they, they, they were thirsty and they didn't have enough water was actually one of the decisive, the strategic. Ultimately, the Nasr is from Allah, victory is from Allah. But that was one of the asbab that was used, that it was the thirst. So this is where the, 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 the Prophet is teaching us by following their, their advice that it's not always the source of wahi to give us our direction on how we implement things. So when we, like the sister's question earlier about, okay, well, what if we have a child where we've, tr we've tried multiple things and it's not really working, what do we do? Or your oh, brother, what's your name? Bilal. Bilal's question about like, okay, sometimes the gentleness and is not going to work. So how do we do that? That's where now we can be like that Sahaba saying, like, okay, where are we going to make our camp? We know the general parameters of the Sunnah. We're trying to um, get as much as we can. And then we're going to make our decision. The other thing, and I learned this from a speech therapist, um, which was the acquisition of language is about bombardment. It's not about like sitting the child down and just giving them one hour of, of, of language. You want to expose the child to as much language as, the, as they can. And even if they don't repeat it, and this was in a situation where the child was having difficulty um, in, in speech, um, and so just, it doesn't matter. If they don't say it, just keep bombardment, just exposure, bombardment. And, and then from all of that language, then they're going to say a few words. By the time a child is three years old, and right, that's when they start, I think at three they have like a vocabulary of like 300 words or something like that, 200 words. You know how many words they've actually heard? Three, what's that? Three million. A child by the time they're three years old, if they're not in a neglectful situation, just the conversations they hear from adults, other people, they've heard three million words by the time they're like, juice please. Right? So all that stuff, just so we can get like more juice, please, or something like that. There was actually one case where this girl, she didn't speak till she was like five or six. And the first words that came out of her, her mouth was, can I have another glass of orange juice, please? That was the first words that she had. So it's happening in there, right? Einstein didn't speak till he was like, how old was he? He didn't speak till he was four. He didn't read till he was seven. So like the, the, the mind is like a, a sponge, it's taking it in. I'm using that as an example because I feel when, 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 we, when we want to figure out how to implement the sunnah at that moment, we really need that bombardment. You're going to read through the shama'il, you're not going to retain everything. You're going to read through this book, you're not going to retain everything. You're going to read through the Muhammad the perfect teacher, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is the translation of Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghudda's book on this. You are not going to retain everything. But you're bombarding your heart, you're bombarding your soul with all of that. And the idea is that at that moment, you're going to say something or do something that's like in accordance with the laws of la language. Does that make sense? Like what the, what's going to come out? Like the, you get all that input and the output is going to be more juice, please. Okay, all right, good. Took us three million words to get that, but at least that sentence is in accordance with the laws of the, of the language that that child is speaking. In the same way, if you bombard yourself with the sunnah and, and lectures and reading books and listening things and, and, and talking about things, hopefully those things that we say or do uh, have a, a better chance of, of being close to um, 
as close as we can to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Ten more minutes for for um, Aisha, and the page that I left uh, landed on was engage other students to engage in answering questions. So let's last last ten minutes for any questions. Yes. Oh, it's not. Um, I can. I'm in direct contact with the publisher. I can. I can see about that. Um, they actually. They were very generous. They gave us permit. They gave us the PDF to pr to to print for our students in prison. I just don't want to breach that amana and share the PDF. Um, uh, but I can ask him what can be a solution for that. Um, they're at our office in Union City. Um, I can bring them in. Uh, what's that? Is there another sign? Mecca has it? Yeah, I think Mecca Books has it. But $12? Yeah, yeah. It's, and it's a very, very high quality translation. The translator did an excellent job. He's a teacher in South Africa, um, and he really put a lot of effort into it. And it's a very, very good translation. So Mecca Books has it. Um, any other questions? Yes, Bilal? Yes. Um, in the beginning, you said every one of us is a teacher. Yeah. It does take a responsibility to be a teacher, and the best way to teach is by being a role model. Um, therefore, you do need a good environment around you to become a good role model and a good person. But I feel in our society, we are a very individual people, and we don't really have that strong community and strong um we don't have that companionship to be, if I found a one person, perhaps they're busy doing other things that they want to better themselves. So yeah. if it's really hard to be around a good environment of people, um, so you can better yourself and be a good teacher uh, for yourself and for others. Therefore, it's a lot easier to find a bad environment around you. So how do you manage good environment versus bad environment? even though the good environment, sometimes they're busy individuals themselves because that's the nature of our society. Yeah, excellent question. So if I were to summarize your question, that part of being a good teacher is having that suhbah, that companionship of other people that can model things for you and also act as like checks and balance for you, remind you. And it is difficult to find that. Uh, people are busy, especially here in the Bay Area. It's very busy. We did the same seminar in Tampa in Florida, and it was on a Wednesday night. You know how many people we had show up? 110. And I told them, I said, you know, we could not get this, this amount of people in the Bay Area. They're like, what? I'm like, yeah, people are too busy. I was like, be proud of yourselves, mashallah. Like, don't think you're like this small community tucked away. I was like, the fact that you, like 110 people, and there was a lot of kids there too, and they sat through over three hours of lecture. I was like, this is really, really good. Um, but there's also, it's not as fast paced as the Bay Area. So yes, it is difficult to find that. What I would say in general is this is what where intention is very important. And Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, who was a famous scholar from about 700 years ago, um, originally from Fas and passed away in Libya, taught in, the, in both of those places. And he says that if you, the, the crux of, of spirituality, and I'm going to go to, his, his discussion was about spirituality, spiritual development of your, of your soul. I'm going to go to that because ultimately our studying and teaching, what is it for? It's for the development and the refinement of our soul. It's part of our ibadah. We're worshiping Allah. So when we teach, we're actually considering this to be ibadah, right? This is a form of worship. So if the idea is worship and spiritual development and, 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 and purifying the soul, he says, the key, the key ingredient, what's that one thing, like I said about care, the magic bullet for teaching, what is that one thing that if you did it, everything else is going to fall into place? See, dua, salah, like care, intention. It is intention, but it's specifically a sincere intention. Sidqun niya. He said, if you have a, 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 a true intention with Allah, and you just say, yeah, Allah, I want, to, I want to be better. I want to be a better person, and, I, and I'm, I'm committed to this. He said, if you do that, Allah will put in your path everything you need. Everything you need. There's a lot of people I've seen, they're like, yeah, I, I can't get to a Muslim country, I can't get to a sheikh, I can't get to another teacher, they're, they're people. And then there's other people, are, I'm like, how did you study? It's just like, well, little here, a little bit there, a little bit over there. And they're like, you got all that from just like here and there? 
And then there's other people who actually go overseas and they, and they change and, they, and, and it's difficult for them. Some of the, the, the difficulty happens like if we, if we find that difficulty, go back and say like, okay, let me reaffirm my intention. And part of that reaffirming of the tension is to be open for those learning lessons wherever they are. It could be, um, it could be from a child. It could be from a, a non-practicing Muslim in general. Every Muslim practices if they're Muslim at some level or another, but a general, not, it could be from somebody who's a critic of yours. They could point out something that's very, helps you in your development. It could be from an inanimate object. Like however, however we, we, were, we looked at something, we reflected on it, and we learned something deep and profound. Or from a book, a book of fiction, or maybe even a cartoon. I watched the cartoon Elemental with my kids. Anybody ever seen it? It just came out recently. But there was one thing that stood out to me. It was like, your temper may be you, yourself trying to, tell, uh, trying to tell you something that you're not ready to listen to. And I was like, wow, that's profound. That wasn't from a sheikh, it wasn't from a khutbah, it wasn't from a like, but, but I was like, that, like, that spoke to me. I needed to, I needed to hear that. I was like, oh, okay, so let me, let me see what, and, and if we're open to those things and we look like, it will, the, 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 the answers, the suhbah that we need will be given. So I know that's not like a, a practical solution, but just going back to Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, that, that he, he said, you know, um, some people might not find a teacher, but they might find the teacher in their spouse. That's what he said. A lot of people don't think about that. And not saying that everybody has to get married or that's the only way, but some people don't think about their spouse as being in the position of their sheikh, essentially. Like you can learn a lot. Your good friend, an employee, um, uh, some, a, a random person. Um, another way to do this, too, is, um, um, is, to, is to invite some of that feedback. Like this is also from the practice of dialogue. They said, if you make it open to people to give you feedback. So like I would, if we had more time, I would actually ask everybody in this. But after an interaction, you could say, what's one thing that I did that was really good? What's one thing that I did that was, just, so just think the last three hours that we shared. What's one thing that I did that's really, that was really good that was like, man, that was really good in the, in, in, in the lecture. I would like to hear that because that tells me where I'm, I have a strength. I should also ask, what's one thing that I could improve? And when I ask that question, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm making it okay to have that criticism. Because normally you don't, you don't give criticism to people, right? And even when you invite that criticism, it's still hard for people. So you have to work extra like, and, and the way to do it is you ask first for the, the positive feedback. What's something I did really well? Um, and then the second, what's one thing that I could improve on? Not one thing that I did wrong, but what's one thing that I improved? And what, this, the person that I just asked this today, and I asked somebody last week, they, they're, they're on separate sides of the world. They both said the same thing. They said, I go off on tangents too much. Did I go off on too many tangents today? We could, but it's sometimes like it's uh, what, and, and I went into this, I was like, okay, Rami, not too many tangents. It's, in, it's interesting, right? Pull up like some stories, but I tr I'm trying to like keep on, uh, on track as much as I can. So. Oh, so Aisha, okay. Um, I don't mind coming back after Aisha if anybody has any questions. And thank you all for listening. Again, we we'll, we'll apologize for not having this book in your hand, but we'll get it. It'll be at Munir's office if you're here for this uh, presentation. And as long as you signed up with your email, you'll get a copy free of charge. Um, and then you can pick it up from Munir. Okay. And then I'll be here afterwards for questions. Jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.